Hey everybody, welcome back to the Sean Ryan Show. This week we got another two-part series with former Marine Raider and MARSOC critical skills operator Prime Hall. We start with his childhood, a very traumatic childhood. I would like to make a suggestion. If you're going through child abuse, some kind of a situation at home, please watch this. There's some advice from Prime on what to do when you're going through that kind of stuff. If you know somebody that's going through domestic abuse or child abuse, watch this. There's advice in here for you. Prime is a hell of a person. He's overcome a lot of trauma, and this is going to help tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people. So please share this. Good news. Vigilance Elite Gummy Bears. Those of you that are subscribed to the newsletter or our Patreon, you guys got first dibs. There's a couple of bags left for the general public. Head over to SeanRyanShow.com, pick them up. And if you're not subscribed to the newsletter, please do that. Patreon, thank you all for the support. You are who makes this show possible. If you can't do either of those, Please head over to Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Leave us a review. With that being said, let's get to the show. Love you all. Cheers. Prime Hall, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me, brother. Dude, it's an honor. I've been following you for a couple years now. Nick Kefalitis, my good friend, uh, we've been friends for a pretty long time, told me that I should start looking into your story. And um, yeah, so I've been I've been Instagram stalking you for a couple (laughs) years now, and and um, sorry, I just I'm very particular with who I bring on here. And um, I just, I really like the way you carry yourself. I like the message you're putting out. A lot of positivity uh, around what you're doing. And um, and I have a feeling this is gonna be one of the deepest episodes I've ever done, uh, mm. especially talking to you last night and learning a little bit about a very smidget into your childhood. I think that's gonna help a lot of people uh, who are coming from a broken home and then getting into your military stuff in your transition and, and some of the things you've been through. I know it's going to be a very, very, very powerful episode, possibly the most powerful one I've ever done. And, uh, which is weird saying that, um, considering I don't know a whole lot about you, but I can tell there's a lot in there. And, uh, I'm just really happy you're here, man. I know I just have this overwhelming feeling that this is going to help a lot of people. So thanks for making it. Yeah, thanks for having me, brother. It's it's a real honor. Um, and I've been, it's like we were talking about last night, how these things connect. But I've been watching the show, you know, for over a year now. And people around me watch it. And you've had several of my close people and uh, people that I respect a lot on the show. So, you know, it's an honor to sit here where I know a lot of um, these warriors have sat and, you know, people that I care a lot about. So thanks for having me, brother. My pleasure, man. But um, so rough childhood, grew up by yourself. I remember you saying that, you know, 14, you were out on your own. 
became a Marine Raider, Special Operations. Now you are you started the Underwater Torpedo League, which sounds like it's going to be a what do you call it? A spectator sport? Spectator sport and Olympic sport. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, I've kind of watched, I've been able to watch you grow that. And uh, the fact that it kind of started as an idea and now it's all the way to this and that amount of time is, it's a, I've never known anybody who developed a sport. And um, so that's awesome. And, uh, and, I learned you got a book coming out here pretty soon, so I can't wait to dive into that. And um, man, we just have so much to cover, so much ground to cover. Psychedelics, transition, getting better, childhood, all kinds of stuff. So um, let's start, we'll start with childhood and just go through your whole life story. This is your biography, but everybody gets a gift. Right. Almost everybody gets a gift <laughs> before before we get into the weeds. Yeah. Surreal. Any guesses? <laughs> uh, gummies. Gummy Damn, bears. you're the first one to guess it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Solid, bro. There it is. All right, cool. There it is. Thank you, man. My Appreciate pleasure. It. Enjoy them. <clears throat> Legal in all 50 states. Some, you know, fortunate for some. Some are disappointed in that, but. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, dude. But, um, so before we get into childhood, <clears throat> I want to, uh, I have a Patreon community, Vigilance Elite Patreon community, and we go over all kinds of stuff in there. Uh, it's an awesome community. But one thing that I do is I give them a preview of who the upcoming guests are on the show. And there are... They're our top supporters. They're why you're sitting here. They're why I'm sitting here. They're they're the reason all this has come together. Uh, really, the sole reason this has all come together because I couldn't finance this all by myself. Um, so it's from them. So anyways, I give them an opportunity to ask the upcoming guest questions. And um, there were two really good questions that I think are perfect for you. Mm. And um, so the first Patreon question is from Dan Wessinger. And his question is, when working with different demographics, professional athletes, Olympic athletes, military members, regular folks, who has the most fortitude? Who says, screw this, I'm done first? Just curious. I'll bet we would be surprised. That's a great question. And... Um just understanding that there's outliers with every population, you know, that there's, you know, so it's not a cookie cutter thing, but generally w with what I've seen with different uh, elite athletes is that martial artists like UFC fighters, for example, um, have the, have a, the most are up there with the most uh, mental fortitude and that they're going to push themselves beyond what their limits are. Um, to stretch themselves and that's part of self-mastery and that's evolving that's what martial arts is about um, and so you know the, like how that translates into some of the training that we do is like they're the ones that are going to show up the most that are going to push themselves the most underwater or with a breath hold or with their training in their fight camp that they're doing with us at the pool or whatever it is that they're doing you know that martial artists, UFC fighters and, and pro MMA fighters, for example, are at the top. Olympians generally are have a drive within them that I've, from my experience, that's from a very young age that they have something in them that basically they have a drive to get to the top of the mountain, you know, and be yeah. there first. And so Olympians have a, uh, have a very, their drive will, I, from what I've seen, will take them far in training and competition. Um, and then, you know, um, so that's kind of the top things that come to mind. And then tactical athletes are have a lot of similarities with that, too, with martial arts, because it's like, you know, you're developing yourself and you're pushing yourself beyond your limits. And that's part of self-mastery, too. Who do who are the first ones to say screw it? Who are the prima donnas? Are there? Do you work with any? Um, 
you know, uh, the, those type of ego type of things or those, that type of culture really doesn't fit with us. So you typically, uh, you know, individuals that have issues like that, they don't really stay for too long. Or if they're coming to build confidence, then we work with them to build confidence. And it's like a crawl, walk, run, okay. building block approach. But if it's a if it's like an ego thing, like and they're not willing to work or whatever, and it's a prima donna thing, like with what you're saying, then like you know, uh, typically the sports that make the most money, if that makes sense, like oh. that would be something that that you would experience from that. But then that's not a cookie cutter saying thing saying that every NFL or every you know type of athlete like that that that's on that type of uh, payroll. You know, it's going to act like that, but they might be less motivated to hold their breath for four minutes than someone that's a USC fighter that's up and coming. That's like, you know, they're hungry. They're making 30 grand a fight, you know, or whatever. Yeah. And they're like, they have an opportunity, you know, but from my experience, it's not it's about your why, too. And your and and not it's not money is not a, a, a sustainable why. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So it has to be like, you know, um, an inner and outward focus thing. Makes a lot of sense. Um, there was one other question from Patreon that I thought was really good, too, and it is something we haven't discussed. It's a long question, so I'm not going to read it all, but it's from Jackson Brown. And what he's asking is, did you ever consider a plan B before joining the military? And we get this question a lot. We get, we get that question a lot, you know, should I have a backup plan? And uh, I will probably chime in on this, but go ahead. It's like a trick question, because uh, that saying, burn your ships at the shore, you know, you don't want a backup plan in certain circumstances, right? Because then that gives you an out. Yeah. You know, but then in in contingency planning, you always want a primary and alternate contingency, you know, emergency if you can plan. But with this, with going into the military, I'll answer my own first. Um, I didn't have a plan B. My grandfather helped me get my court stuff figured out so that I, and made deals with the judge to get me into the Marine Corps instead of going like to jail, you know. Yeah. So like. My thing was like I needed to get all my court stuff cleaned up, and I, I had no other options. I was like, basically, like, just I was going, I was just getting into too much trouble, and I needed to get uh, find some purpose and some, like, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, learn how to deal with authority and like domesticate myself a little bit, you know, like, yeah. um, so, uh, but, um, I, I didn't have a plan B. I was like, like by the grace of God, I got into the Marine Corps after a year of like paperwork and waivers and shit, you know? Um, so, but for anybody going in to the military, like, and we will get into it, but like, First, I recommend, like, well, what options do you have outside the military? Why are you going into the military? Like, and then make sure that it's something in the military that they're seeking that they're going to actually get going in. Yeah. And then what's their why going in? And then, yeah, if you're going in and you're going to be uh, and you're going to go into a job like a pilot or something that feeds into some another job opportunity in the civilian world or whatever, then you can start to map that out and create like a operational strategic plan, yeah. right? But if you're going into a soft pipeline, yeah. if you're going into BUDS or Raider training or something, you're not like, hey, if this doesn't work out for me, then I'll go be on work on Wall Street or I'll go work at my family business that's really doing well right now. And you give yourself that fallback. Then when it's a week with no sleep, and it's the weather sucks again that day and you've been awake for whatever and you're not eating and you're getting slapped at Sears school, or whatever it is, you're going to be like, dude, I'm just going to go back to the family biz. I'm not going to play. I'm not doing this stuff. Yeah. So you have to have, you can't give yourself in some circumstances, you can't give yourself a backup plan. Yeah. So I'm right there with you. I think 
the question was in, in the it was in the military. I think, you know, it depends. I think it depends what your primary motivation is. You know, if your motivation is to go into the military, into special operations, and become an elite operator, you know, there's only a handful of us. You can't have a backup plan for that. You know, you got to be 100% focused, 100% all in. And if you're planning contingencies for your failure out of that, then exactly what you said. Then when the going gets tough, you're already going to be like, well, I can just go do this other thing, you know. And uh, and it's never going to work. And I've never known anybody who's gone through that had spoken of a backup plan. Have you? Um <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah, like, that made it. No. I've never I've and, never heard a backup plan discussed. It's not something that would come up in discussion, but everybody that had a backup plan quit, you know, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. And now with the regular military, you know, if you're doing it because you want to give a portion of your life or you want the experience to grow up and get discipline or you know you just want to serve your country for a short time then yeah definitely have a backup plan because you know that's not what you're going to do for the rest of your life but and even if it isn't what you wind up doing for the rest of your life like me i i thought i would have been a seal for the my whole life going into it there was nothing else i wanted to do then i got there and things changed and uh i didn't want to do an entire career but going into it I was 100% all in. Not there was nothing else to do. Yeah. And um so backup plans can come later cuz nothing's going to last forever, but going into something that need where you're going to need that amount of drive, determination, discipline, backup plans just don't work. Same with on an operation. You know what I mean? If it's just you out there, you know what I mean, you can't be you can't be thinking about anything else other than the mission. No. You know what I mean? You got to get home. That's the plan. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you got to do what you're going to do and then get home. That's the plan. You know, there's different ways you can do it, but in the end, you're going to have to go through it, you know? 100%. <clears throat> but, but anyways, so is Patreon. But, um, so now I want to get into your story, you know? Like I said, I know it's going to be very deep, and uh, I can just see it in your eyes, and uh, we'll go at your pace. And if you get uncomfortable, then that's okay. We don't have to go there. But where'd you grow up? Um, I grew up in South Texas in uh, a place called Corpus Christi. And um, so uh, it's, um, it's an interesting part of Texas because, you know, people think of Texas and they think of, like, ranches and all that stuff, and that's all there, too. But there's also, you know, big cities like Houston and San Antonio and whatever else. And so Corpus is kind of, Corpus Christi is kind of like a, a small city, big town kind of thing um, that's connected to North Padre Island. So there's, like, a, a bridge that you cross, and then there's an island beach town that's connected to Corpus. And so I grew up there um, most of my childhood. And then um, later on, I went to military school. And then my uh, after my parents divorced, my mom moved down to South Padre Island area where my uh, grandparents and family live. And I lived down there um, before I joined the Marine Corps. Okay. Um, and then that's kind of where I go back home to visit my grandparents and stuff. Any brothers and sisters? Yeah, I have... Uh, um, one younger sister that's four years younger. You guys tight? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. We've, we've like, you know, we've uh, been separated for a lot of our life, but uh, we have a tight relationship now. When did you guys get separated? Um, really, like, when I went into the Marines. Um, okay. I didn't talk to my sister much um, during that period of time for about 12 years, minimal contact. Um, and then even after that. Do you want to talk about your childhood? Yeah, sure. What'd you like to do? It's funny because my, my, uh, my grandmother 
uh, Barbara that's passed away. Um, I spent a lot of time with her when I was growing up, and she was a synchronized swimmer in college. So she would have me, uh, like, you know, in these little swim things when I was, like, two years old, you know, at the at the country club or at the pool, you know, like, um, that she lived at, um, taking me to these little swimsuit competitions and, like, stuff, you know. Yeah. And, like, had me in the in the pool, like, all the time, you know. So that was kind of, like... You know, I was never on a swim team or anything, but I was in the pool a lot. Um, I loved that. And I went to the beach a lot, and I was in the ocean a lot. Um, and um, and then my friends, uh, my two best friends growing up um, were uh, brothers. And they were all into uh, fighting and, like, uh, you know, like, Capoeira, um, Tough Man had just was out. That was before UFC and then UFC was coming out, you know, like, um, but like that whole thing. So we were it very, like when I was growing up, very into like grappling and like fighting and like, you know, like warrior type uh, activities, you know, w- with my friends, with my best friend and his brother that I grew up with, um, you know. Uh, and so um, I grew up, uh, you know, with my parents and then my sister, um, and I think my first significant event was uh, when I was seven years old. I was um, at my house. There was like a a gate in the front that kind of like went up to the roof on this side. And then you could climb the gate and then walk out on this little like security brick wall. Oh, wow. You know, that was like seven feet tall, you know, or like eight, whatever it was, you know. And so I used to climb up the gate and then I would get onto the brick wall and walk across, you know, and it's grass. So then I just hang down and jump off or whatever. And so like uh, I was getting up and it's kind of a funny story about my mom, but um, I, I was climbing up the gate, you know, and I'm like kind of always on my own program. And, uh, and I'm like, you know, doing my thing and I get to the top of the gate and my mom's like, oh my gosh, no you're going to fall. It was like a, um, it's like a psychological trance, you know, when you're a kid and you're like, tell your kid, don't spill the milk. Yeah. All they know is spill the milk, you yeah. know, like, so it's like, you're going to fall. And it's like, and I fell back and, uh, landed on my head. And that was my first concussion, like traumatic brain injury from my fractured my skull completely. So my head was mush for a year till while my, Skull reformed. Starting your own business can be extremely tough, especially when you get to web development. You never know who to trust, especially if you're not a techie like me, and that's where Shopify comes in. Not only do I personally endorse Shopify, but I also utilize the platform for SeanRyanShow.com, and here's why. Shopify is the e-commerce platform revolutionizing businesses all across the world. Whether you're selling Vigilance Elite gummy bears or Vigilance Elite gummy bears, Shopify simplifies the selling process both in person and online so that you can focus on successfully growing your business. Shopify covers every sales channel from in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform. It even lets you sell across social media marketplaces. Packed with industry-leading tools, ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you complete control over your business and your brand without having to learn any new skills in design or code. Thanks to 24-7 help in the extensive business course library, Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way. Now it's your turn to get serious about selling by trying out Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash Sean. That's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash Sean. Take your business to the next level today. This is Possibility powered by Shopify. That's shopify.com slash Sean. The U.S. dollar. How many of you out there still have any confidence whatsoever in the U.S. dollar? Probably not very many. I don't either. You see, there is a growing concern 
on the devaluization of the U.S. dollar right now, and rightly so. Here's why. Inflation. We are at an all-time high right now on inflation. It will now cost you $12 to buy one carton of eggs. That is absolutely absurd. Let's talk about interest rates. Interest rates through the roof. If you're in the market to buy a house right now, you're going to get roughly 50% less house because they've raised the interest rates so high. Let's talk about the stock market. Way down, especially the tech stocks. Crypto, way down. Congress, spending more money than you or I or anyone else we know can even fathom counting. And the feds, what are they doing? They're just printing money like it's nobody's business, devaluing our dollar. Meanwhile, China is running around the globe right now, striking deals, latest one, Saudi Arabia and Iran. New oil deals, trying to turn the yen into the new reserve currency, which in turn will devalue our dollar. It might be time to start looking at where to protect your money and you might want to look at precious metals. I believe gold and silver is one of the safest assets to protect your savings and your retirement against inflation and recession. If you're interested in investing in gold, I suggest you call my friends at Lear Capital. The team at Lear will provide helpful information about purchasing gold or converting part of your IRA or 401k into a gold IRA. Call Lear at 1-800-741-741. 0551 or go to Learshawn.com. I started investing in gold back in 2020. When I saw what was going on back then, I knew we were in for a financial crisis and I started investing in precious metals immediately. Once again, call Lear at 800-741-0551 or go to Learshawn.com and get your free gold and silver investor guides and receive up to $15,000 in free bonus medals with a qualified purchase. Information contained within Lear Capital's website is for general educational purposes and is not investment, tax, or legal advice. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Consult with your tax attorney or financial professional before making an investment decision. Damn, how, how high was this? Like seven or eight feet tall, but I landed directly landed. on my head. Oh, shit. Yeah. So that was like, you know, like, I just remember like, you know, them trying to keep me away, take me to the hospital, in the hospital, going through the MRI, you know, um, like, what is this? You know? Yeah. And then had a bunch of MRIs. But, um, but anyway, so uh, that experience, you know, I was like, for a year, I couldn't do, like, re, you know, play with kit, play or do anything. Like, I was, like, reforming. My skull was reforming, so I was in a sensitive kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, re fully recovered from that. I had a lot of headaches, I remember, um, during that time period. And then recovered. Um, we moved to a new house when I was eight years old. And we lived there until my parents divorced um, when I was 12. They divorced when you 12, were 12? Yeah, thir 12, 13. Like uh, um, right after uh, middle school, going right into high school, they had moved. My mom had moved away. My sister moved away. But like um, we lived in that house from that time period. And when we moved in there, like I don't know how long afterwards, but shortly after. Um, I had, a um, someone that was watched that was coming up to my window in my house, you know, cause like the house was structured to where it was like my parents room was in the back, you know, like where the backyard is and mm -hmm. it's all fenced in. But then my sister and I's room was on the side of the house where there was no fence and there was a lot of vegetation around my window. So someone could come up and hide in there and basically be there right yeah so i didn't you know it's kind of like a boogeyman type thing at first right where it's like very scary that someone's in your window you somebody know? was in your window yeah a peep, like, it's a peep it's called a peeping tom yeah 
Yeah. I mean, like, right up on the window? Right up on the window, watching me um, for years, breathing on the window, like, tapping the window, like, psychological warfare, because I was living, I would, so I started living in my, staying in in my closet and sleeping in there, you know, because I didn't want this guy to see me. It was very uh, bothersome, and I told my parents, but... They didn't. They hadn't caught him yet, so they didn't believe it. Are you serious? Yes. And, I mean... Who... Did hmm? you know this person? No. How often would it happen? Um... Like, I don't know, man. <laughs> often. Like every know, night? Like, uh... Multiple times a night? Multiple times a week kind of thing. Holy you know, like, shit. Yeah, like this happened for a long time, you know. And uh, what, what, when I was in the closet and it would get bad and I would knock on the, my closet wall would back up to my parents. So when I would bang on it, then they would turn the lights on in the house. So now all the lights come on and he would take off. Then we would go outside, you know. Sometimes my dad would have his gun and we'd go outside with me. No one's there. So now it looks like I'm crazy again. Now we come back in and I'm like, I don't like, so I started to just not tell him, you know, like I wasn't reporting it anymore. And like my, my aunts and uncles and my people that in my family that I'm close to, um, they've all told me you know, like, had conversations with me over the last few years about, like, you know, what I told them when I was this age, you know, and that nobody did anything. But they did they did catch him. So my mom and dad caught the guy probably when I was 12. What happened? They caught him in the window uh, in the... And, um, heard a disturbance and then my dad went outside with the gun and the guy ran out from the window to the car to the p- park near our house hopped in his car and bounced and my dad was like behind him running you know um, so they they told me so it's like at least that at least I you know that at that time that was like okay yeah. That validated it because I'd been through a couple years of this. Years? Years. And like when my friend, best friend would come over and spend the night, we would be playing like little evade games where we're like, you know, you got to you gotta go from the closet to the bathroom. So you got to like go under the bed or you got to go around the desk, you know, um, to and then on your stomach out the door and then you can close the door and then he can't see you. So then you're free in the hallway. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So then it's like, um, but it was, uh, it was a very, uh, put me, it was like a fight or flight situation for a long time. And it was, uh, when I remember riding my bike around and there'd be a car behind me and I don't know if that's the guy. That's was it ever the guy? I don't know. I never caught it. Like, I never had a face-to-face or anything, or I don't know what he's, you know, I couldn't describe him what, you know, what he would look like or anything like that. Was he wearing a mask or? No. But you could see him in the window. I obviously. could just see, like, his silhouette, because he's in the black, he's dark, he's, it's black, it's dark outside, and it's, there's more light inside than there is outside. Okay. So, like. All I see is breath and, like, you know, whatever shadow type, you know. Damn. Um, But I wasn't, like, you know, I was. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, But anyway, so. uh, And then, like, caller ID had came out, too. So, you know, I was getting a bunch of weird calls at my house. And then this stuff was going on, and I was kind of. You know, but, um, what happened to the guy? Um, 
I I mean, so when they caught him, they cut all of the vegetation around my window and they put a security light. Okay. So that's what happened for for me. And then we moved out like a, within a few months. So like, I mean, did he I don't like, know what happened to him. Did he get prosecuted? I I've I don't know what his name. I don't know, you know, but um, that whole experience was just. You know, I kind of buried that. Yeah. And then I went through my life. I went through military and all that stuff. And uh, and then it got brought up after the military, you know. Yeah. When I stumbled into these random healing things, you know, it was like, you know. Damn, you people, really buried it. Yeah, people hypnotized me and fucking brought it out, you know. Yeah. That's how deep I buried it. Wow. Did you realize that when you, did you realize how deep you had buried it? No, it's no, it's just survival mechanism. Yeah. But like also, you know, that's not something you share at a cocktail party. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> so how long were you sleeping in the closet? Um, probably three or four years, but I started to become resilient in there too because I started to even reframe things and like things like, oh, well, this is actually not that bad because guess what? I don't have to make my bed anymore because my bed's always perfectly made in the center of my room because I'm never going to sleep in there. <laughs> Damn. And I had like, I had so, I, and I had all these shelves in my room and all the shelves had like action figures on them and shit. And you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. With like the fight scenes and stuff. And my bed was perfectly made. And so my room was perfect. And I was like, that's fine. So now I just stay in here. And it's like, you know, um, and, um, you know, I, my, par my parents and I had a lot of, you know, I had a lot of abuse growing up and stuff like that in different ways. But uh, my parents and I are close now. What kind of abuse? Well, just... Um, you know, physical abuse, for one, with my, you know, but, uh, um, but that was on top of uh, this other thing that's going on that's like psychological abuse. Um, and, um, and then I was a lot younger than most people in my grade. So growing up, I was like, you know, a l small, Yeah. you know, so I was like, my birthday's in August. And so, you know, I'd be 13 and, and everybody else is 15 in my grade kind of thing. Yeah. Because you know? I started school early and I was a year ahead. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you're like two years behind so I'm everybody. Run. Yeah. Especially once people hit puberty and stuff, I was like like a little kid in my grade, you know. Yeah. But then with these situations at home and kind of, uh, you know, in my neighborhood, like the park down the street was like a gang type thing, you know? So for me to have free passage and, and like kind of stuff, I had to like, you know, get jumped and, you know, do like stupid shit like that, you know, to, um, that's a lot to unpack here. So you were abused by sexual predators. Well, it just peeping a, Tom. Peeping I mean, Tom. A, yeah, he never touched me or never. Yeah. yeah, but just fucking in the window. Then you had physical abuse going on with your parents. Then you had to deal with peer abuse, or I don't know what you would call it, gang abuse, peer abuse. Yeah. You know, what What was going on with your parents? Was it punishment or was it? So I think like, you know, my, my uh, you know, um, my it was right before they divorced too, okay. you know, like, so like things are just. Things are out of whack. Things are out of alignment, you yeah. know, and it was like, just, you know. Um, They're taking their frustrations out on you? Yeah. Both parents? No, just my, yeah, not my mom, but my mom was there, you know, my dad. But uh, I think it's also, you know, like, um, because of the the there's a there was a 
since the with the peeping Tom thing, like that created a serious problem with me and my parents. I can imagine. And so I think that that like costs a lot more problems, you know. Um, who knows? But um, but anyway, everything happens for a reason. Yeah, I feel like so. Well, Prime, there's a lot of there's a lot of kids going through that kind of shit, you know, a lot of them. And so, somebody like you talking about that, what you went through, and what you are now, is going to bring all of those kids and all, and the adults, you know, who've never overcome it. You know, it's going to give them a lot of hope. Do you want to go any deeper? Yeah. Um, what uh, specifically? Let's talk about the abuse from your dad. What does that look like? How would it start? Um, you know, have, you know, like if my, uh, either if I did something, you know, like I got in trouble doing something, you know, and, uh, and then it just got taken away out of proportion. How old? Um, I'd say like started when I was like eight, nine, ten, eleven. Like, so legit. Yeah. So honest, like little mistakes that every eight, nine, ten year old make that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um. You know. How would you get approached? Oftentimes it would just be, uh, you know, kind of like a, it's like dealing with someone with high blood pressure or someone that's like, you know, needs to be on some kind of meds or something. And I think that was a big part of it, you know, because like my dad's different these days because he's on med, he's on his like high blood pressure and all of his medications that level him out and regulate him. But like at that time, you know, um, so if he had a bad day or if there was something I did that sparked a punishment or something, then it would, you know, go from there. Um, I want to ask you a question, and I hope it doesn't offend you. But I want to know, because I think a lot of people that deal with this have this issue. Why, you, right now, I can tell you don't want to dive into this, and it's not because you don't want to talk about it. It's because you want to protect the abuser. Why do you want to protect the abuser? You're making excuses for things that happened and they just happened. If you do tell us, that's all you're doing is telling us what you experienced. Yeah. You're not diming anybody out. You're telling us how it happened from your, from your vantage point and how you experienced it. Why don't you want to do that? I have like a, a sense of, um, you know, people that are in my circle, you know, in my family tree or anything that, you know, I protect. I've, I have a, 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 a sense of protection over it, but I see where you're coming, where you're coming from. And I appreciate that. And, um, uh, you know, uh, my parents and I, we fell out um, when I got out and I did some of this, stumbled into some of this healing stuff. And like I said, you know, um, and we'll get into that, but, uh, you know, I had, it opened up Pandora's box of memories. And so I didn't want to talk to my parents anymore, you know, and we didn't talk and we were completely separated, like, you know, whatever. We didn't have a great relationship before that, but uh, we're not on speaking terms at all for a couple years. 
And then after I went through some of my healing stuff with the five, um, I reconnected with my family. And what my mom told me, because when I reconnected with my mom, I told her that I wanted to have an accountability moment with her. And we did. And what she told me was that there were times where my dad stomped me out in front of her and that she should have called Child Protective Services, but she didn't. And she regrets it, you know, she should have done that, you know. And uh, I'm grateful that she didn't. I'm grateful that everything played out the way that it did because that's how I got here, you know. And like, had she called, it would have ended up differently. Maybe I would have gone to a different fucking, into a system, you know, different from the system that I ended up in, you know. So, um, kind of, uh, you know, and where I'm at now is like, I'm in full possibility that me and my parents are gonna, you know, just continue to build our relationship and, you know, work through our stuff and not continue this cycle for pe- for our family members coming behind us, you know, learn from this shit, lessons yeah. learned, and you know, grow. You know the the only the only way to move past stuff like that is to is forgiveness. It's the only possible way to move past that. How did you find forgiveness? Well, um, I had some healing support that really helped with the surrender aspect because um, I think from my experience, I had like a broken kind of thing where it's like, I'll never quit kind of thing and that I'll never surrender, you know? And it's like, that was the I'll never quit mentality was holding me back with this like, you know, I'll never, I'll never forgive these people for what they did to me kind of thing. You know, when it's like, when you're doing that with anybody that you have a grievance with, you're just like taking poison, you know, and expecting the other person to get hit. Nothing's going to happen to them. They're going to keep doing the same shit. You're just, you're just toxic. You're just poisoning yourself by, with the grievance. And so, but how, how do we know that? That's just like, over time, you know, unless you're like a psychologist or something, you know. Yeah. So you moved away from your parents. You well, got in with you my, moved in with your grandparents. Well, so uh, my my mom and sister moved down where my grandparents live so in South Texas, down okay. by Mexico, and. Uh, I moved in, my dad and I moved out of our house and moved into like a condo. You stayed with your dad? I stayed with my dad, yeah. Well, because I was going into high school and my all my circle of friends and everything that I grew up with were in there. So I was like, I don't know anyone down there. I'm not going to high school down there. Like, you know what I'm saying? Did that, does that make sense? I mean, in one aspect, it makes sense. In the other aspect... I would think that you want to get the hell away from the abuse situation. So you and I did, and I tried to go live with, with my mom. mom. I tried to go live with my mom for a little bit, but like, to me, my having my friends was important to me. So I ended up back in Corpus, you know, um, yeah, because I was all the people that I, I really had a strong group of friends, and that was what I relied on, you know, a lot. So growing up, you know. And so I wanted to be, I tried living with my mom for a little bit, but I moved back. And uh, and so um, I ended up living kind of in an apartment by myself because my dad was living with his girlfriend. And So you wanted to move back with your dad because there were no rules at this time. He wasn't- that, was a track, that was part of it too, um, because There, you know, everybody else had lived with their parents and had rules. They had you know? curfews. They weren't allowed to drink. They weren't allowed to drug. You could have parties. I get it now. 
yeah. yourself, you were. And I wasn't really, yeah. And I, and I was like, um, but it wasn't, uh, it was oftentimes, sometimes I would have friends over and stuff like that, but it was a lot of times just like, you know, being in there by myself and, uh, you know, like my grandma would give me rides to school or I would have to figure out rides to school. And then I got my hardship license when I was 15. So I had a vehicle when I was 14. What's so, a hardship license? In Texas, you can get your license when you're a year early. Oh, a driver's license. Yeah. Okay. Driver's license. Yeah. So I was basically, you know, I had my own car and everything when I was 14 and I was, you know, living at my apartment, you know, and, uh, how were you supporting yourself? I had like a, you know, uh, allowance to some extent, like, um, from my family, but I wasn't, uh, you know, I was very resourceful. Did you come from money? It sounds like what your you parents mean? had money. No. You're talking about a gate to your house that you fell off at seven no. years old. Yeah, no, I was like, it was all like, uh, what do you call it? Middle class. Okay. Know? You're talking about an allowance that's enabled you to get a car and an apartment at age 14. Yeah, no, not, not like that. Like, they, like I got, like, a beat-up ass, like, Mitsubishi Montero, like, dump truck car that I drove for a while until I totaled it. And then I got another truck or something. But, uh, um, but anyway, it wasn't like that, really. You know, uh, I have um, my um, grandparents... My dad's parents were successful. Uh, was my grandfather was a sex, successful attorney in Texas, and okay. then my grandparents on my mom's side are very uh, like hardworking but successful construction people and okay. architect like builders, you know. Um, so upper middle class. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but uh, and then um, growing up, I also have my uncle Steve who's a successful business guy, marketing executive uh, in San Antonio, Texas. And so, you know, I would go, he would take me to like the Cowboys game or something and he'd be presenting on the middle of the field at halftime and stuff. And I'd be like, whoa, you know, like, <laughs> so seeing that stuff's possible, I feel like is very important for young people, you know, to see that stuff. Cause like seeing my uncle Steve do that and then seeing like his, you know, business that he had in his house and all of his, you know, cool stuff and whatever else. It's like, wow, some of my family's doing this, you know, this is possible. Yeah. That's a, that's, I could see how that would bring a lot of hope. Yeah. And my grandparents would take me. So every summer on vacation when I was growing up and it was always about like to become resourceful, to learn about different cultures and all that stuff. And so Sometimes we'd go to San Antonio and go, like, around, like, historical places. Sometimes we'd go to Mexico. And as I got older, they would take me to different places in Mexico. But a lot of summers growing up, I would go to, like, San Miguel de Allende in Mexico and stay for a week or two with my grandparents. And they had a house that they would stay at down there in the summer for a little bit. And uh, so I loved the Mexican culture. And every year on Christmas Day, my grandparents would take us into Mexico uh, with a caravan of, like, suburbans and trucks, like all their construction vehicles and everything loaded with clothes, food, toys, like anything that we could scrap to give to people for Christmas. And we would go into the poorest neighborhoods and deliver all that stuff. Damn, that's awesome. And we got to a point where every year we would have to actually bribe to get across to take the stuff, even, and we would still do it. And we fit, we we would always make it work up until the security situation got to where it did, and and we don't we don't do that anymore. What's the draw to Mexico for your family? Do you have Mexican heritage? Yeah, okay. on my grandfather's side, but um, you know. Uh, like my my grandfather built a lot of these uh, Mexican colonial type buildings, and so he would go into San Miguel de Allende where he would have all these special subcontractors and artists and stuff that would build all these, you know, special finishes that he would put on these buildings and houses and stuff. 
So, you know, he's my, they, they were constantly going down there for, you know, construction materials and art stuff and, and all that type of stuff. Um, so, you know, we've, I've just always been going, we, we used to go hunting in Mexico, like duck hunting at a ranch in Mexico, um, almost every year. Uh, I grew up going like, you know, to like, you know, all these like senior frogs and like these types of places. Cause when you're over, when you're, when you're 13 or 14 years old in Mexico, then it's like you're 21, you know, you have full access, you can drink, you can go to any bar, you can do anything, you know. What kind of stuff are you doing? We, we kind of brushed over this last night at dinner yeah. on purpose because I wanted to keep it vague for today. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. No, so um, my grandparents are, uh, have always been like, you know, uh, really good about kind of like keeping me motivated and like, you know, uh, setting me up with opportunities to like go have fun and, and do stuff. So like, you know, whenever I was like, uh, young, you know, like, uh, elementary school, they would take me to the amusement parks and they would tell me stuff like, Hey, figure out how to get in the front of the line, you know, figure out how to get as many rides in as possible. You're on your own today. Like, you know, I'm like, and so I would like come up with all these things like, Hey, I'm just looking for my parents. And I get to the front of the line, you know? Yeah. And so they were constantly, they were kind of like training me, you know? Um, and then, uh, they'd take me to Mexico, you know, and we'd be at like, you know, there's like a restaurant there and in San Miguel called Mama Mia's. We go to dinner there, you know, and I'm like 13, 14 years old. And then they'd like, it's eight o'clock at night or whatever, and, uh, nine o'clock. And they're like, all right, we're going to head back to the hotel. You're, you know, go ahead. Here's some money, you know, um, just be back by one o'clock, you know, have fun. And like, then I'd be in the, in the nightlife, you know, and, uh, and so, um, that was, you know, what did that lead into? What, like those, you know, uh, just, uh, I mean, being young and being exposed to like, you know, I mean, you're talking 13 years old shit. with a one o'clock curfew and, <laughs> and and grandparents giving you money to go party in Mexico. Yeah. I literally have never heard that before. Yeah, dude. And I can see level. that could lead into some... Uh, <laughs> yeah. That could, that could go into some they different never, directions. And they never stopped. Like, even when I... Uh, when I um, went to boot camp for Marines, I had been in a lot of trouble before I went, and then I got all my stuff taken care of, and I went, and so they said... When you get done with boot camp, we're going to be at your graduation and we're going to take you to Vegas to party. <laughs> oh, my God. <clears throat> so they did. They rented a town car and we drove straight to Vegas, dude. Damn. And we partied. They cut me loose. Hey, we're in Vegas. It's not, it's like eight, we we, we're, it's, it's like we're going to bed because then we got there like at dinner time. We're going to have dinner and go to bed. Do your thing. You know, we'll see you at like lunch tomorrow. Wow, <laughs> I've never heard of the grandparents like that. That's incredible. Yeah, there's there. That's you know, my grandparents have been my uh, my why for a long time. Really? Were you dealing drugs at a young age? Yeah, I mean, like on a, I wasn't like on a high level or anything, but you know, in not on the border area, there's a lot of acti drug activity, and uh, you know, it's definitely. Um, so let's talk about that. that. What got you into dealing drugs? What kind of drugs were you dealing? Um, I mean, I lit like, I don't know, uh, cocaine, cannabis, cocaine, yeah, ecstasy. A little bit, yeah. Anything else? Uh, no, nah, that's pretty. That's All pretty street good. drugs, any prescription stuff? Um, a little bit. And how I got into that was, uh, like I worked in Spring Break in South Padre Island, you know, and uh, I went to military school. That's the part we didn't talk about. We'll get there. Boarding school. We'll get there. But that was a big like. 
because like a lot of people, a lot of kids at boarding school kind of open up your perspective, right? But um, when I got out, I was at uh, before I went into the Marine Corps, I was working at South Padre Island Spring Break, and uh, one of my jobs was working at uh, Club Revolution, which was like a rave club that opened at two a.m. You know, how old were you? I was eighteen. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is like I couldn't get a job at the other clubs at that age, but I could get a job there. So during the day, I worked at the Radisson Hotel, which was like the main place that everybody went, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, did that. And uh, at night, I would work at Club Revolution, and that was where I saw a lot of crazy shit, and that's got introduced to all this stuff um, with uh, with the drugs and everything. But if you look, like, South Padre Island's right on the border of Mexico, so all that stuff over there. But um, with all that stuff, like, uh, getting into all that before I went into the military, I'm grateful for that because I don't want to be involved with that stuff at this point in my life. Yeah. Like, I've already been around that street life. How did the first, how did you first get into dealing drugs at 18? Is that when you first started, was 18 years old? Yeah, working at, uh, you know, Let's get into the nitty gritty. Like, how did the how did it go? So, um, you know, you uh, basically get, uh, you know, uh, back then, like with cannabis, it was about hydroponics. You know what I mean? So, like, mm-hmm. you get access to like a pound of hydroponics, and then you got a digital scale, and then you're breaking off you know, grams to eighths to quarters to ounces to QPs, half half pound, whatever it is that you're doing yeah. with whatever it is. And then depending on how well someone teaches you, then you're basically got your business of how much you get it for and then how much you break it off for and sell it for. I mean, with that, guess what I'm kind of getting at is something has to spark the interest into getting into that kind of a business, you know, so... Were yeah. you just doing it and then selling it to friends, or was this no? I think it was, was this just, an operation. Yeah, I I think it was just that like I like, you know, I was being I was being gravitated in these environments that I was in towards like the hitters, you know, towards the, like the action type people that were like, I don't know, prominent like, in the scene. Yeah, the ones that like were seemed like they were had shit figured out i don't know you know and it's like um i'm here i work at this club and these guys have all this things that they're doing right yeah and so talk to those guys if you want to start getting like if you want to be like yes then start doing what they do yeah but at that time like to be completely clear i i was getting in so much trouble and i wasn't anywhere happy or fulfilled or like liked any of this stuff and that's why I was beating my head against the wall and I have so much drive and everything but if I don't have purpose then like I'm just gonna end up like in trouble yeah you know what I'm saying I have drive I want to make impact but if I don't have purpose and I'm not like on some kind of a path or have a mechanism to add value to something then, like, it's just going to go down. But I think also, like, do we see all these movies and they glorify all this stuff, right? And that's mm-hmm. our culture. And then I live in an area that's like, that's like Scarface, machismo, like, drug dealer kind of, like, suave type culture. And it's, that doesn't, I mean, that's not realistic. Yeah. That's a pipe dream that they sell you on a movie or something, you know, and that these guys, all those guys that were cool in the club, they all died or went to jail or have miserable existences in some way or hiding out from people or they got robbed. Yeah. You know, like... I can imagine. How many people were you dealing to? What do you mean? When you were dealing drugs. 
How many people were you dealing to? I mean, dude. 10, 20, 100. Like 20. 20? Low, yeah. Low key. And then I had experiences where I would live with drug dealers, but I wasn't really like the dealer, you know? Um, so. You lived with drug dealers? Yes. How did that happen? Um, I went to, uh, so when I graduated college or high school, my first college that I tried was uh, Texas Lutheran University. And uh, when I got to that school, my roommate was a drug dealer. And we ended up moving out of off campus and living together. And he was a drug dealer from New York City. And uh, was he pushing a lot of drugs or? Uh, he was pushing like uh, not. I would say like uh, he was doing. He was a cocaine dealer, but he was doing. He was getting like fronted like a few ounces and and flipping them over a couple of weeks or something like that. Okay. So nothing major. No. Nah. Nothing major. No, but that. Some of those guys got into major stuff, you know, while I was in the military. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, but, um, so I really lucked out. Let's go back to military school. What got you in there? Well, did that, so did I cover what you were talking about with the childhood stuff? Yeah. Um... Cool. Yeah. So military school was a, was a blessing for me because uh, my grandparents had came to take us on a uh, on a summer vacation, and they f saw for the first time that I was actually living by myself in the apartment, and they're like, "Damn!" You know, they're like, you know, totally blindsided by it. They were their minds were blown, and they didn't have a good relationship with my dad because they're not they're, you know. This is your mom's yes. parents. Yeah. Okay. So since the divorce, they were not, you know, so that they were just like, this is unacceptable. So when we, when I went back, uh, or when we went on the vacation, we were up in San Antonio, and there were these kids from Texas Military Institute. That's a, called TMI. That's like a military school there. And they were in uniform out at the mall that we were at. And I was like, man, I wish I could do something like that, you know. And my grandparents lived near uh, a military school, Marine Military Academy in Texas, in Harlingen, Texas. And so uh, they're like, had like a light bulb. And whenever we got back, before school started, they offered to take me on a tour of the school, of military school. Mm. So I went down and I went on a tour, like golf cart, around this beautiful campus dude like here's a gym you're gonna have access to that here's where you're gonna live here's the chow hall here's like the iwo jima monument here's like all this stuff and it's just like this historical like just powerful you know tour and i'm like yeah of course i'm in my grandparents are paying for me to be there they're gonna pay for me to be there it's like i don't know 20 grand a year or something you know, so yeah. I was like, yeah, dude, I'm in. And most kids get sent there unwillingly against their will. Cause they I was almost one of those kids. Get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was it was uh, threatened several times. I, there was no part of me that wanted to go to a military school. Dude, that's awesome, man. It's so uh, fascinating because when I got there, it's like learning everyone's story of how they ended up there. It's really cool. You know, a lot of people have, like, some type of criminal thing that got them there, you know. And there's kids from all over the world. We had, like, the second richest family from Russia kid that was lived with me that was in my thing. Um, we had uh, a lot of Me people from Mexico, from all parts of Mexico, you know. Um, so, but, like, my first roommate, for example, he got caught uh, driving around in a suburban Paint, rolling the windows down, blacked out, paintballing, spray painting, or spraying people on the street with paintballs. And then, like, went back to his house and they 
had got his license plates or whatever, and that's how he ended up there. And he ran away every night until he got sent home, you know? Yeah. But it was like, uh, so anyway, getting to military school, dude, was uh, was awesome. And getting in there, it was like, you know, uh, it was a real environment because you you live there, there's fights, and you can't talk and expect that someone's going to protect you or that, like, you're going to get to just walk away from that. You know, you got to stand behind your words and, um, you know, prove yourself, especially at the beginning, you know, yeah, because you're living in the environment, you know, and, like, it was wild. Where did your interest for the military come? Where did it come from? It didn't. Like, I, it was just, like, random. I don't have any military people in my family, you know? It was just, uh, I saw these kids in uniform and something. So even going to the military school, you didn't have any interest to go into the military? No. When did that develop? When I was there, for sure, because when you're there, when we were there, we had a lot of like our uh, our drill instructors were were Marines. A lot of them were Vietnam era combat Marines that were drill instructors. They all had been drill instructors. Some of them were a couple of them were force recon. So we would get like you know we had leadership class with a force recon you know officer, wow. and he was giving like. He would be showing like, you know, uh, obstacle course and like, you know, f like field training video and like all these things. So it's like you're getting indoctrinated, dude. You don't even realize it. Yeah. Like I'm watching like Force Recon and I'm just like, this is it. <laughs> like this is so sick, you know. But I ha I wasn't I wasn't thinking about the military. I was, but I was I loved all that stuff, you know. And I love being in the environment at military school where it's like, you know, this is real. Like, if you, if you like, uh, you know, if you rat on all of us, you're going to get choked out in the hallway. <laughs> like, in between, uh, like, changeover in between uh, study hour tonight, you're going to get choked out, you know, like, or whatever that, you know, whatever it is, dude, but... There was always something going on too, man. Like, it's like, cause we had four hours every night where we had to be behind our desk, like in study, you know, or three hours, whatever it is. And there would be people be passing information. Hey, someone got in between the break. One of the kids that's here for hacking, Kim, he got caught with his arm caught in the Coke machine downstairs and he's stuck down there, you know? <laughs> And so then we all go down and they're like doing crazy shit to this kid that's stuck in the thing. But it's like, there's always something yeah. every day going on. And while, while I was there, I had my, I had a Jeep Wrangler that I had parked because my family lived close. So I had my vehicle parked at the airport parking lot that was conjoined with the military school. So if I could find a way to get out of the gate, like, cause it's a secured it's a secured facility, so you literally have to break out. Like, it's not like Shawshank, but you got to get out. You got to find a way out. Like, yeah. for because security's roving, and there's all the things that can catch you from getting out of the initial thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um. What do you? What about military school? What do you want me to hit on? Hey, I just want you to tell your story, man. But. Um... Is that all you want to cover with that? Um, I don't really know if I covered like key points of military school. It's, it's just, it was such a foundational thing because I was coming from like scarcity and no rules and kids need rules, you yeah. know? And so that was like, you know, having that and then knowing that there wasn't any bullshit, there's no peeping Tom, there's no like, there's no one bothering me. That was a safety blanket too. Yeah. Cause I'm like, dude. I'm free. So you liked all the structure that that brought? I loved brought. it. I loved it, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> well, what did you do after military school? You went to college. We covered that a little bit. Became a drug, de <laughs> became a drug dealer. 
What got you, what eventually got you interested into joining the Marine Corps? Um, so I had gone back down and I was working uh, sp spring break and I was getting into a lot of trouble and I was, you know, went to jail a few times. Um, and uh, What'd you go to jail for? Um, possession and uh, public, like, uh, what, what was it like, you know, one time I was like a, had like a bouncer type job, so I had a lot of IDs, and so I got caught with like falsifying government documents. Yeah, because I had an ID that wasn't mine when they searched me, okay. you know, or whatever, and so like stuff like that with these other things, um, and uh, you know, mainly I had one uh, possession charge that my grandfather helped me get out of. I got all, I got, I, I ended up like clearing all my stuff, at least taking care of all of it. But, uh, before I joined, um, but dude, like, you know, I joined in 2005, you know, I probably started my paperwork in like Oh three or Oh four to get in. Oh, wow. But, uh, if it wasn't Iraq war, there's no way I would have gotten in, dude. Cause now people with a D DUI or like, these things they can't get in. And I literally had a rap sheet, you know? Yeah. And um, so it was, it was really uh, by the grace of God that I got in. And my grandfather was like, hey, you know, I was sitting outside of my house one morning, like no sleep in front of my house. And my grandfather was getting up and going to work and he walked over to me and I was like, I'm lost, you know? I don't know what I'm doing. And he was like, do you remember when you were at military school? And he was like, you did, you, you really liked that. You know, what if I took you to the Marine recruiter and we talked to him? I was like, I don't know. Man. I don't think that that's possible. You know, he's like, well, let's just see. So we went and I did like my ASVAB and got all my shit and, you know, signed up and then Told him some, like a little bit of stuff, but I didn't tell him anything really. And then when I went up to MEPS, you know, on the bus, I went up and did all my, like, swore in and did all that stuff. Like, they ran my background, and then that's when all my shit popped. So then when I came back, they're like, dude, there's no way we can get you in, you know. It's just not possible. So I went back home, and then maybe like a month later, I got a call from one of the recruiters. They are probably hurting for numbers. He's like, dude, I can't give you any guarantees, but if you'd be willing to work with us, I think we might be able to have a slight chance at wavering you through. <laughs> so I went in and started writing these like witness statement waiver things, you know, yeah, and like getting all my story, you know, and, uh, and, uh, after like, you know, I had to go out like, go through this long process but then finally I got in you know after a year and I went to MEPS like dude I don't know, 15 times or some shit like 15 times a lot <laughs> I'm saying like a year and a half in the in MEPS so by the time I was in the I was in there so long that I had pissed some this lady this marine lady off in San Antonio MEPS to where when I finally got to boot camp in San Diego that she put a hit on me to the drill instructors out there. So they got me off. When I came off the plane, they were waiting for me, like, before anyone else. You know what I'm saying? Are you serious? So I got to play the game before anyone else. Push-ups. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. What, yeah. Did you, what did you want to do in the Marine Corps? I don't know. You know, um, I wanted to do what they were doing in the videos in the force recon class that I was in in military school. I wanted to be like, you know, in the like crawling through the mud with a rifle and like, you know, like warfighter stuff. I didn't. But when I got in, I had to take whatever they would give me, you know, and I took artillery because that's what they gave me. And I didn't have an option because I was barely getting wavered in. Yeah. So it was like, I took that job, but they told me that, you know, nothing against artillery or any MOS in the military. I have nothing against any of them. And I applaud all of them, you know, but 
for the for this, they told me that like you're gonna be king of the battlefield, artillery, da 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 da. And when I got to Marine boot camp, it's like all my friends were infantry, and I was like, ah, I want to be infantry. That's what I want to be. That's what I'm. Think mm-hmm. my think my mind is wrapped around you know, that's it. So then when I went to, so I went through boot camp. Um, let's hold on before we get into the military. Let's wrap childhood up. Yeah. And and uh, and then we'll take a quick break. Cool. But you had a really rough childhood, and I, I know we barely scratched the surface, but there are a lot of kids. A lot of kids that are going through that kind of stuff right now. There's a lot of adults that have never overcome that from when they were kids. And so what I want to ask you is coming from an environment like that and and it started at seven and didn't end until you went in, what advice or do you have anything enlightening to tell somebody that's in that situation right now? Yeah. or that's been through that situation, can you give them any hope, any words of advice, any words of wisdom? Yeah, the two biggest things that come to mind is, one, your uh, get your support system around you, you know, like 360-degree security. Like your support system, you can do hard things if you have your support system aligned with you, you know. So for me, that's like my circle of people, my wife, my kids, like all my close people in my life, like they helped me to move through this stuff and they've helped me to navigate through it over the last five years since I got out. Um, And then the second thing is, you know, um, allowing yourself to feel whatever emotion that it is that's coming from that, you know, and communicating about it, you know, and then as soon as you're able to like reframe it as positively as possible that you can, you know? So like for me, an example is like, there's been a lot of breakdowns that I've had, you know, over the last five years about the peeping Tom and like, why did that happen to me? Why me? And that's a victim thing, you know? And that's a breakdown. But then the breakthrough part of that is like, you know, if I really look at, at my life, that, that guy, that training that I got when I was in the closet and all that experience that happened, that that was like some of the most powerful training that I've gotten in my whole life, you know? And as much as I've had times where I don't want to drop kick that guy in the chest, you know, and put ratchet straps on him or whatever, you know? Yeah. Like I really would shake his hand or like maybe give him a pound and be like, dude, I don't know what type of weird stuff you were on, but I appreciate it because that shit made me who I, that that got me right here, you know, I'm able to make impact on other people or however I'm able to, you know, um, add value to people's lives and even my kids and anyone else that, that mean that's meaningful to me. So, so when you're talking about moving past that, because a lot of people never move past their trauma. It's like they get stuck in this circle. Yeah. You you want to be over here, but you're right here and you're stuck in this circle because you can't stop thinking about that victimization. You're stuck in a pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Or a trap, as you you like to call it. Yeah. You're stuck in a trap. In a feedback loop. If you don't figure out how to mentally move past that, you will always be stuck in that trap and you're never going to wind up over here. So getting your support network down, like you were saying, to move out of that trap, to to mentally move past that trauma, that victimization is imperative if you want to move over here. And yes, an approach versus avoid. You know, a lot of us avoid and mask. It's like, I don't want to deal with this shit or I'm just going to block this person or whatever it is. And it's like, approach. If you approach it and lean in and just like, let's go. What is it? You know, it's like, that's usually it's like, there's not really a boogeyman there. You lean in, you deal with it, you process it. It might be like emotionally challenging to process it. Process it, lean in 
And then what's the, what's next? What else? Yeah. What's the next hilltop for me? Um, but any breakdown can be a breakthrough. You know, any loss can be a win. Any trauma can turn into like a powerful learning point that you could share and help other people. I feel like, you know, it's just like, how are you going to frame it? How are you going to um, leverage it, you know, when you're able to? Yeah. Perfectly said. Let's take a quick break. All right. This episode is sponsored by HVMN. You've heard the buzz about ketone supplements and how they can boost your workouts by helping your body use fatty acids for fuel. I take a shot of HVMN ketone supplement before my morning workout. It's focused energy. It's not an energy drink, though. It's like a feeling of being in the zone. I don't feel hyper jittery, anxiety, stuff like I get when I drink too much coffee. Ketone IQ comes in portable, convenient shots. They're great for cycling, long runs, and all kinds of workouts, and can help you stay sharper on a regular basis. We also just received some exciting news. In addition to being available in select Equinox gyms, Ketone IQ can now be found in local Sprout stores nationwide. The taste may not be great, but it doesn't really matter. I wish I had this product when I was on active duty. Let's just say I think the product's pure. Again, it's not an energy drink. It's not full of a bunch of stimulants. You could get better endurance. You don't get the crash and it could help curb the appetite a little bit. Definitely a unique opportunity here in offering my audience 20% off your order of Ketone IQ. You can find Ketone IQ at hvmm.com. Use the promo code SEAN at checkout to save 20%. Plus, if you subscribe, you can save even more. This stuff is great for daily use. Use the promo code SEAN. Again, that's hvmn.com. Promo code SEAN for 20% off Ketone IQ. Serious question. Who wants to take the best shit of their entire life? Right here, I do. How do you do that? You go with Bub's Naturals Collagen Protein. You rip the thing open, you put it in your coffee, you stir it up, and you're on your way. Now, if taking the best shit of your entire life doesn't interest you, Collagen will also give you beautiful hair, great skin, and nails to die for. So, and you'll recover a lot quicker in between workouts if that's your thing. So now that we got the good shit out of the way, get it? Let me tell you a little bit about Bubs the company. Bubs is a tribute company to Glenn Bubs Doherty, who is a Navy SEAL and a CIA contractor who died defending American freedom in Benghazi, Libya. Bubs donates 10% of all proceeds to veteran organizations like the Glenn Doherty Foundation and 100% of all proceeds on Veterans Day. Let me tell you about Bubs' latest product that helps with energy healthy digestion, your immune system, and your metabolism. Bub's Naturals Apple Cider Vinegar Gummies, which actually taste so damn good that I ate all 60 of them the first, <laughs> the first night I got them. They taste amazing, and man, I got a lot of energy now. Anyways, go to bubsnaturals.com, use promo code SEAN, to take 20% off your order. Thank you, Bubs Naturals, for being a sponsor of The Sean Ryan Show. All right, Prime, we're back from the break. We're getting ready to get into your military career. Awesome, brother. Um, I, I wanted to go over one more thing from our conversation earlier. So um, with, with childhood, Right. One, my biggest takeaway from that whole experience is basically, um, you know, fear mindset and versus and scarcity mindset and military mindset, security mindset, how that's all connected. Right. And so those experiences put me into fear mindset and and, uh, you know, security mindset and all these different things. Um, 
that in a lot of ways set me up for set me up for success, but also at the same time hold me back, you know, in different ways. So now, like, you know, looking at fear and love and just like abundance mindset of like positivity, love, like, you know, abundance, possibility, right? But like I have my comfort zone is like going back to this, you know. So it's like, you know, how do I challenge myself to do more of this and to stop wanting to go back to this, you know? Because, like, as soon as I feel threatened or something like that, I am real quick to go back to this. It's like, oh, well, I hope that that person tries to do this, you know, or whatever. And it's like, no. Why do I keep doing that? That doesn't work. Let's get a little more specific, like we did on the break. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> go ahead. Give me the example that you gave on the break. So, uh, you know, like whenever I was... When you're welcoming people to do bad things to you. Right. Because you want to act. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, you know when I was in the closet and in that experience, and then when I started to get physical um, abuse, that I started to control it, you know, in my mind and try to take control and say that, you know, I don't care if they hit me, you know, um, or when I would get jumped at the park or at school or anything that would happen, I'd always, you know, like after a hit or something, you can't really feel it you know, your adrenaline goes up and whatever else, and it's just whatever. You might have some lumps and, like, some soreness or whatever, but, like, goes away in a couple of days, you know. So it's, like, just a way to control it, you know. But then it got to the point where, like, you know, because I was younger significantly than most people in my grade, so in high school, like, you know. I think what you're saying, I'm going to paint this for you because you said it really good on the break. You said that you revert back to that mindset all the time. That mindset being you're so used to abuse, you're so used to being in these situations that you try to recreate them. And then I had mentioned in my three and a half years of therapy twice a week to get my shit together, I learned that from my therapist that humans will always revert back to what they know. Whether that's good, whether that's not good, whether that's bad, you know, you always revert back to your comfort zone. Your comfort zone at that particular point in time was abuse. And you painted this picture where you said you, if you were walking home through that park, you would walk with a limp to try to entice that person to come fuck with you mm -hmm. so that you could... Get into an altercation. Yes. Yeah. And you had mentioned that you still revert back. You still catch yourself reverting back to that sometimes because you are so used to it. And exactly. And I'll let you elaborate from there. Yes. So, like, you know, I don't drink now. Like, again, I have three years not drinking now. So if I'm out at a bar with my friends or I'm DDing or whatever it is, I'm out in an environment where there's people that are drunk and there's people that I don't know, you know, um, that, uh, if, you know, I catch people looking at me or trying to sur like surveil me, if I'm a soft target, you know, that they might want to like try to rob me or do something to me that I'll try to make, I'll want to make myself look like a soft target so they would try to do that. That's my first thought. And then I'm like, no, like be a hard target. And then you don't have to deal with the problems. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know what. And so it's like a, it's a conflict. Um, you know, it's yeah. like you have like a, a person on each shoulder, There's two sides. a voice on each shoulder, you know, but, uh, but at the end of the day, I don't want any conflict. I want peace. I want abundance, possibility, all that stuff. It's just that sometimes my re jump jerk reaction is that, you know, you know. I get it. Act weak. 
so you can teach this fucker a lesson. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I totally get it. But um, and I'm glad you brought that up. So let's move forward. Let's move into your military career. So you're, you're at boot camp. Shining star. You wanted no. to be. <laughs> yeah, you wanted to be. You're in artillery, but you want to be infantry, and that's about where we left off. Yeah. Um, you know, I've like the more I learn, I think that you know our emotions drive our actions at certain things, and so I've looked at different phases and like what emotion was driving my actions at that time, and literally once I got to San Diego, I was surprised that I got in. 100% surprised. Like, I felt like I got away with something. Really? And I was in. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so um, when I got there, like, I got to San Diego and I was seeing, you know, um, for example, the seagulls, you know, like the seagulls back where in South Texas look like, like they're little, uh, like, rats, you know, and they'll, like, take your lunch from your car if you turn around type of thing and these ones out in san diego look like toucan sam like everything is flush nice abundant it when you're walking around downtown san diego where the recruit depot is where you have to do all the marching and it's like that's a big like oh it's so hard to do the marching but the whole time we were marching i was checked out and just observing all of the like environment in San Diego is so nice. All of the houses on the hills downtown, the weather is nicest. So, uh, but because I had, that was only because I had the experience of Marine uh, Military Academy. So that, that's why I, when I was at Marine Boot Camp, I did boot camp when I was 16 at there, you know, where you actually get hit and things that like, it's like, uh, there's some things that are a lot more legit at military school than what I experienced at boot camp. So I was kind of like, are you saying that mili the military school was tougher than boot camp? hundred percent. No shit. Yeah. Yeah. Cause well, I mean, physically demanding boot camp, real Marine Corps boot camp, like, cause they have, everything's expedited. So real Marine Corps boot camps, three months at military school. It's a month. At Marine Corps boot camp, you do a three-day crucible at the end that leads into you climbing the hill and becoming a Marine. And at military school, you do a one-night crucible. You okay. Know? But it's like the the things about military school that that make it so legit and authentic is, is uh, that the student run the students run the 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 accountability in of the school inside the dorm underneath the drill instructor there are, so you run your own discipline so after the so there's a, the chain of command is the students okay so you'll have you know a student that's been there for 2 years that's like you know got a junior leadership position the people that have been there 3 years 4 years that are standouts they're the company commander and then you have like the the, the staff underneath them and so, like, you know, it's a – so the students run the discipline in some ways, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so uh, that's why, you know, so, like, and, and in the Marine Corps, you're not going to get hit. You're not, like, from my experience. Yeah. Um, from a drill instructor, from anything like that. It's, they've had that happen, and they, you know, so there's – they make examples out of that and they don't do that, you know? So from my experience, I'm like, man, they're not going to hit me. And I get to be in San Diego and let's play the game. Yeah. So it was relatively easy for you. Yes. Except I did think that cause my drill instructors had, were like telling me that I was in trouble, you know, that like my, paperwork was not good and all this stuff. So I didn't know that I was actually going to graduate, you know? So I was kind of like, I didn't have like any aspirations of doing anything. I was just yeah. kind of like. Just going through the motions. Day by day. Get kicked out. Day by day getting thrashed too. So that was my first experience getting thrashed, you know, like push-ups, 
do this, this, jumping jacks, do this, do this, do this, like, or whatever they call them. Bah, 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 bah. And then, like, okay, now when you think you're going to be done, now you're going to go for longer and longer and longer and longer and longer and longer. And then everybody else is going to leave. And you're going to be the one in trouble that's doing this all, for hours that you're still doing this. And so it's like, okay, cool. Like that, you know, um, getting some of those experiences, all that stuff. And then I graduated. So then once I graduate, I'm like, this is real. I'm good. You know, my, my grandparents took me to Vegas to celebrate and, uh, you know, and then I came back and, uh, I checked into, so at the end of boot camp, once I knew I was graduating, you have a couple admin days, you know, and so I went and I uh, was working on getting my, because they had a, a little uh, information thing where they said, if you get to infantry school and you want to switch to infantry, you can, and like blah, blah, blah. And so I was trying to start that process then because I wanted to get switched. Mm -hmm. So then when I got to infantry school, it's like two lines. You're going either infantry school or you're going to Marine combat school. And Marine combat school is all the other jobs that are not infantry or recon or whatever, you know, like the warfighter combat MOSs. Yeah. And then these are non-combat MOSs. And so they go to like legit combat training, like balls to the wall for 17 days because they might not get exposed to any of that until they're on deployment. Okay. So I get so I'm supposed to be in the infantry school line from what I thought from what they told me at boot camp. So I'm in and they're like, "No, nah, you're in you're in combat training." And I'm cuz you're artillery, you're not infantry. So then I go and I'm like, "In this, but I'm but I want to be in infantry." They said that we could switch and I already did da da da. So I end up in our I didn't end up in combat training training day 1. Hey, I need, and then they had a brief. If you want to go to infantry, you can, whatever. Training day two, training day three, all the way, like, I'm about to graduate. And I've been telling them since we started, like, I want to get switched. Yeah. Like, you've been saying we could get switched. Remember, you, like, and um, finally what worked is uh, I sat on my bed one morning, my rack, and said, I refuse to train. You know, I was private. And uh, I refused to train. What? Like, and then this one person ran up, instructor ran up. I refused to train. Are you sure? Yes. You know, and like straight face. And then they run off and then they run back and they're like, grab all your gear and then meet outside. Grabbed all my gear, went outside. They had me turn my gear, get all my gear for infantry school. And then I go and check in. That's what worked? Yes. <laughs> I refuse to train. And that's a tool. Keep that in your back pocket if you're in the Marine Corps or something like that. You know? <laughs> right on. You probably got a whole company of people now that's going to refuse to train after they watch this. Yeah. play. Well, I mean, if if uh, understand your operational environment and play the game accordingly. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I refused to train. Got It worked. Got put in infantry school. So now I'm awaiting infantry training with all my buddies that have just been sitting around for a few weeks while I was doing this other combat training. And they're all just sitting around fighting each other. Everyone's got a knife in their pocket. And I'm like, cool, this is good. You know, like, this is a good environment. You know, yeah. this is, all my buddies are here. Like, you know, and then we started infantry school. So um, infantry school was pretty, like, uh, pretty cool. You know, like, pretty uh, standard experience um we uh you know we would go out though on the weekends and uh and so um we i had a group of guys that were with me that we had like a a, a play, like the same thing that we started doing you know weekend after weekend where we would get you know the bus when we got off work on friday to take us downtown san diego we stayed at a certain hotel and we had like the you know this system and then we would take you know this uh whatever it was taxi to the tram to the sdsu frat parties and the sdsu parties right nice and that worked until it didn't work you know <laughs> um, <laughs> um so uh you know one night 
we were out we were at one of the parties and I mean we would do stuff like we would throw the kegs over the over the fence and then just take the keg back to the hotel you know <laughs> um and stuff like that but uh um one night somehow we thought that because my wallet was gone and we thought that one of the frat guys had my wallet so we locked the front door and we searched we started doing like wall searches on those guys and uh we embarrassed a couple of them and we took their you know like we uh emptied their pockets and like you know whatever i don't remember like robbing them but we just took their stuff out and whatever else um and they reported us back to base and so monday morning when i showed up um they were calling me my name and my liberty buddy the guy that signed out with me on friday and uh so that was my first experience of like the kangaroo court system what is what is uh i mean i can't see a marine too upset that you heckled some frat boys but that's just <laughs> yeah no nah, for sure but so these guys you know they tried to burn us you know yeah. they tried to burn me so they were saying that i was like doing things there that i wasn't doing you know mm -hmm. and so uh like illegal you know activities yeah. like selling drugs or whatever it is that they tried to like pin, put, on, you. pin on us to try to burn us you know um but uh so anyway, like I got pulled out of training and I got put like sat down on a bench and then they put crime scene tape around my locker, like around my bed and my locker where all my shit was. And then they started like interviewing anybody that saw me that weekend. Right. Yeah. And then these guys are coming out of the interview and I'm stuck, I'm stuck on this bench for like a full day. And like they're just coming out, and like people that I know, right? They're just looking at me, going, <laughs> "I'm like, what, dude? No." <laughs> they're like flipping all these guys. Yeah. Some of them know, but you know. But anyway, what ended up happening is like there was nothing. They were trying to burn me, and all the shit was false. And I like you know took a drug test and went back to training. Right on. So um, went back to training, but that was kind of my first experience of like the UCMJ, yeah. you know, like how that how that stuff, how that games, you know. Yeah. So uh, so anyway, graduated uh, infantry school and uh, went to two one, second battalion, first marines, infantrymen, riflemen. And uh, immediately, like, my first day um, in my infantry platoon, I got pulled because all they just got back from Iraq. And uh, our, the they were all pretty tight in the platoon. And they had a couple slots to send to sniper platoon. And they didn't want to go because they wanted to stay with each other, most of them. So they sent the new guys that just got there that met the qualification with like our fitness test, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I went to snipers the second, like the the first week I was there. So the first week you show up to infantry school, they send you to Marine Sniper School to, to Indoc, yeah, to Indoc. No, 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 not to Sniper School. Oh, okay. To Sniper Platoon, to the Indoc, to like start to get assessed, like to uh, the tryout. Okay. Yeah, that was like I don't know two months. I mean, how did you feel about that? A lot of I know a lot of Marines want to go to that school. I was surprised again. I'll bet. Um, at that time, I was not grounded at all, and I didn't have any goals being there. Some guys that I was with at infantry school were already getting kicked out of the Marine Corps for different shit, like yeah. trouble. You know, people that I was hanging out with and stuff on the weekends, and. uh and, um, yeah, so, you know, I was surprised and, uh, but I saw it as an, op as an opportunity and, um, so, and, uh, what worked for me is one of my buddies from infantry school got put into my platoon with me and he got the same opportunity. So it's like, I had a, a 
a guy that was going that was with me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That I helps know. a lot. So we were both like, all right, we've got to get this gear, you know, like we're like a buddy system, you know. So then we got whatever, got into the end dock. And then, you know, that was a good experience, too, because it was just learning, like, you know, how to, like, mentally deal with running the hill all day, you know, and then doing land nav yeah. and then doing this and then doing the stock and then doing that. And then doing that, and then doing that, and then being on the working party to get all the guns clean, and then doing that, and whatever. It's just like, and then crawl, being a pig, you know, in the, in the sniper platoon, you're like always doing all the grunt work, you know, but they're, they'll make you crawl from like yard line to yard line and all this different stuff. And um, What do you mean being a pig? Like a pig gunner? Like a 60 gunner? It's a pig no, so like in the in sniper in the Marine Corps, you're a pig or you're a hog. Okay. So a pig is a professionally instructed gunman. Okay. And a hog is hunter of gunmen. Interesting. I've never yeah. heard that. Yeah, so a hog is someone that's completed Marine Corps sniper school. Okay. And so everybody else is like, you haven't earned that yet. And so guess what? You get to earn it every day. And if you live at the barracks, you could tell her in it every night too. Got it. You know, because every time we call you out to come out front, come out front. Mm -hmm. And the train model that we use is right over here in the back of the barracks. And all the holes, fighting holes are there and all the other sh stuff. So there's the hill that you run. So it's like, it's not going to, it's always, you know. So anyway, it was a good experience on some fronts. Um, but uh, I ended up, um, my stepmom was killed in a car accident. And so I got a Red Cross message while I was, like, you know, in training. And this is after I, I maybe been there for six months or something, right? So we're past the end dock. We, we're in the platoon. And guys that, are, that I came in with are now, like, some of them are starting to get ready to go to sniper school and stuff like that. Um, so... Uh, but anyway, um, I got a Red Cross message that my my stepmom got killed in a car accident. You know, were you close with her? I had, you know, uh, not yet. Uh, what do you mean? Were you close with your stepmom? Yeah, but we actually had like, you know, we weren't. Um, we didn't have the best relationship, mm -hmm. but we had a relationship. You know okay. what I'm saying? Yeah, and. Uh, and so, um, anyway, I got a Red Cross message. Uh, my battalion was gone on a little mini float that they called Rimpack, where they go to Hawaii, on the ship to Hawaii and come back, right? And so was, the whole unit was gone. It was really just sniper platoon and a few other people that were back, you know? So my lieutenant was, like, playing God back there, you know, and, like, had this thing where... You know, I was leaving, and my uh, staff sergeant that was in charge was trying to hook me up and make sure that I got to the airport and everything. So he was like, you know, had me get my bags ready. I had my flight, I had all my stuff to go home for the funeral. And then they had me come in to check out. And uh, th I saw the staff sergeant's face, and he was like, you know, looked like he was sorry to me and was like, hey man, report report in to the lieutenant. And the lieutenant's behind his desk and so I go in and report in, like, you know, Marine reporting, you know, private hall or private, whatever I was, private first class hall reporting as ordered. And he was like, hey, you know, I heard about this, the news, you know, stuff happens. And uh, so, um, but uh, we just can't lose you for, from training right now, so. What I'm gonna need you to do now is go back to your room, put your uniform on, and load up on the trucks, cause we got a stock. And so I was like, and it was like it was like hazing, but on like a psychological level. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I had to just take it, but like part of me right there 
fuck like died like a flip switch when he pulled that shit to where I was like I do not care about any of this shit like sniper platoon none of you like you know so I I um you know I kind of like started that shifted me immediately once they yeah. did that I ended up going on that stock that afternoon and I remember I lost my veil you know because I was just out of my mind and like you know uh it was kind of interesting because as I was I was getting um you know processed out kicked out of the platoon for a behavioral drop right because of my relationship with the lieutenant and everything that basically from this whole thing. And, uh, and basically I was like, you know, telling people at the barracks, like, I don't care what my rank is, dude. Like we're fucking Marines. Like it's man to man. No one else is here. I don't have my fucking, you don't have your rank on your collar. Like, you know, Yeah. but that didn't work. So they didn't want to play that game. So it was all this fucking hazing bullshit, you know, that they were all keepers of the badge when this guy wasn't, the lieutenants had never been to sniper school. Don't, Marine Corps officers, they don't even get the opportunity to go to sniper school, do they? They're just fucking admin nerds with an ego trip, with a power trip. He wants to tell a fucking 18 year old kid he can't go see his dead stepmom. What would you say to that guy right now if he was sitting right where I'm at? I just say he's a jellyfish. Fucking, fucking weak, piece of shit. Weak leadership. I hope he watches this. Fucking cocksucker. I hate that kind of shit. So here's the funny thing, though, dude, is that because, like, everything comes full circle. But, like, people like that, I mean, you fuck people over like that. They always fucking lose in yeah, the end. Yeah. So I'm on radio watch, right? Like, the least important thing on top of the hilltop, you know, and they're all, like, all the sniper teams get inserted, right? And it's during, in Camp Pendleton in Southern California, there's times of the year where it's fire zone and there's no pyro. Do not pop pyro, right? Because it's a, you'll, start a, uh, you'll start a full fire across, you'll burn a whole range to the ground, if not more, at Pendleton real quick. So there's no pyro allowed, right? Mm -hmm. So, the range, so the, the range safety officer, which was the lieutenant, popped pyro once the teams were inserted, burned the entire range to the ground. Go we figure. had to extract another everybody. fucking incompetent <laughs> fucking officer. Go figure. We had to extract everybody. Immediate extract. He was calling over the radio for them to try to ex uh, uh, put the fire out with Gatorade bottles. With Gatorade as bottles. I could, and I could, as I'm on the hilltop, I literally watched it spread with my finger like this. <laughs> so anyway... That was cool too, because you know, you we got pulled out. You know, we we're supposed to be in the field all week, yeah. and we get pulled out the first night, and our to lieutenant save this gets burned. Ass. <laughs> yeah, and the lieutenants. He got burned, dude. He got relieved of his command after that. Good. So fuck him. But that. So after that, I started getting in trouble. He's probably gonna see this. I love that. <laughs> Hand salute, sir. Um. But, uh, so, um, but anyway, that happens for a reason, you know, and yeah. that really, that was a gift for me because it gave me drive and motivation that I wouldn't have had. And that's what got me into MARSOC. What, how did that, how did that give you drive? <laughs> um, because, because the way I understood it, the way I understood what you just said is the, he, not only did he was the Lieutenant on an ego trip and enjoyed fucking you out of going to your stepmother's funeral, but he also turned the entire sniper team against you with the hazing. Or were you saying that it was just him hazing? Uh, he didn't turn the entire team. There were good dudes that were playing that that sick game, yeah. but there were a couple of bad ones that were that were snipers that were playing the game. And I had serious mono y mono problems with that. And like... Um, you know, especially with alcohol, right? So like during the day in the Marine Corps, we all have rank on and you can say, hey, get your ass to the armory, you know, get out here and clean this, 
sweep the floor, blah, 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 when there's mm-hmm. the higher-ups that are around, right? It's like, da, da, da. But when it's just us, like, it's real life. There's no, fo- there's no theater arts here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't give a shit what your rank is. Like, if you talk, like, you know, does that make... Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I lived without rank for my first almost three years in the Marine Corps because I got in trouble. And it was a gift, a blessing, because I was on restriction the whole time and I was walking around with no rank and I would watch people with rank and I saw how it created a weakness for people and I saw, I reframed and I saw how having no rank is actually a strength. You see what I'm saying? How's having no rank this? A strength in certain ways it is like because if i'm attached to my rank that's a weakness and you're, if i have to use my make rank, their rank their identity yes like that's what's so cool about soft is that in like in raider training we take our rank off for 10 or 11 months and you have to earn respect without your rank and if you can't do that you can't be there because people that hide behind their rank don't deserve to be there yeah well, there's a lot of that. Yeah. And so, and, and even when you get out, it's like, I get out, it's like, dude, my rank doesn't matter. What rank I had in the Marine Corps matters this much. Like, who cares about that? What attachment do I have to that? And they're like, oh, well, you know, you were in for 12 years, and so you should kind of be like, you know, you should only talk this much and then this guy that's been in for 25 he should like it's like no dude i don't really give a shit about any of that pecking order or any of that bureaucracy game everything's merit-based performance-based like that's the only thing that matters yeah so what what happens let's go back into that so he lieutenant gets kicked out because he burned the damn range (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and I'm going back to the grunts, so I just kind of go back with a smile on my face and then, uh, you know, go into the grunts and, like, you know, it's pretty fun, like carrying a machine gun around, getting ready. We think we're going to Iraq um, and uh, and then end up on my first deployment was like a year-long training deployment. Really? Yeah, but I got in trouble once majorly before I left where... Uh, and it was like, you know, I was upset from that, this incident and I was drinking and then I was like pushing it, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Where I was like kind of trying to see what happened, what would going out and mixing it up, you know? And so, um, I was in downtown Oceanside and I was drunk and, uh, I got, um, in some trouble and got rolled up by the cops and then ended up like getting slammed and going through that whole thing. And then cops took me to the front gate at Camp Pendleton and dropped me off. And and then the duty tr- from my unit came to get me from the front gate. And I ended up like, you know, I'm like a private and that guy's a staff sergeant or whatever at the time. And I took his hat or his cover and did some shit, you know, and wasn't listening to him and didn't stay in my room when I got back like they told me to or whatever else. And so I ended up getting, like, my, you know, the little rank I had removed and put on restriction, you know, maxed out, no pay, blah, 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 blah. That was my first time, you know, getting that, going through that process. And, um, and so, uh, that's the kangaroo court system, the UCMJ. So you go through, you know, and it's like, what what training or, uh, like, qualifications do any of these people have to be running, like, legal proceedings that affect people's careers? And so, but anyway, so anyway, um, I signed this stuff and whatever. I went through it. I, f- I fucking took it. Um, lost rank, pay, and all this stuff was on restriction, carrying a folder around, checking in after after hours, every two hours, no pay, you know, just yeah. work, working out a lot, whatever bullshit. And then deployed, and I was on, you know, we, 
I, we flew to Okinawa and then we we're on a ship, you know, and going back and forth and then coming back to Okinawa. And we went to, it, it's a 31st Mew, but they call it the 30 worst because it sucks and it's a training deployment and it's the worst Mew <laughs> uh, that as Marines think. And uh, we got extended for a full, like, extra deployment. So we're there for a year. So we're going to, like, you know, um, South Korea in the winter time doing fighting holes for a month. Miserable. Yeah. Coming back to Okinawa, doing jungle training, going to Philippines, doing a month in the f- fighting holes, training the Phil Marines. Back on the bus, back on the ship, back to whatever, going to uh, Australia, t- month long patrol with the Australian Army. Horrifying, dude. <laughs> like, that shit, that was the hardest training that I did That out of my whole military thing. No that kidding. deployment. Legit, dude. Legit. Wow. And the infantry is no joke. And, like, that's the thing is, like, you know, because, like, in special operations training, you think, you know, I'm going to Hell Week or I'm going to Field Week. That's going to a prep for Hell Week or whatever that is. And so there's going to be little to no sleep, you know. Dude, you go do patrolling ops with the infantry Marines. They're not like those guys were not sleeping. You know, they were all Iraq vets and they were in there. They would we'd get to the patrol base in Camp Pendleton. They would have already been up for 24 hours before we started. And then they'd stay up for days and they just like get so into it, you know. Um, So. uh, But anyway, um, So I started working out a lot on that deployment, too. But uh, I was on restriction the whole time. So what else are you going to do? Yeah. You know? And then when I got off restriction, finally, at the very end, I got in trouble, like, real quick. So we were at Camp Hansen in Okinawa. And it's, like, I don't know, really hot out there. And uh, blacked out drinking, you know? And uh, it was, like... Camp Hansen Fest or something like that. There was something going on. And uh, and I ended up, like, back in front of the barracks, and I got into it with uh, one of the staff sergeants that was in my company. That was a former drill instructor that I didn't get along with. That always had altercations on the ship. When we were on ship, he'd have me go, like, he had me go all the way around. And just, like, stupid shit like that. This guy always trying to... So I was blacked out, and I saw him and ended up in this altercation, physical altercation that resulted in me getting fully maxed out, almost kicked out of the Marine Corps. Damn. So I woke up the next day, and people were like, dude, what's wrong with you, man? And I'm just like... And all this happened in front of people that I knew, you know, that, could, that I felt like could have stopped it or whatever, you know, that's like neither here nor there, but... Um, but anyway, I was like really so. But it were it worked out perfectly because it was like when I woke up and I was in trouble. I didn't. It was like someone else had committed the crime, and I was like, I don't remember anything. I don't remember anything from like yesterday afternoon, like at all. Mm-hmm. And so you know, because it was so similar to what happened that first time I got maxed out, that they were looking at admin stepping me, kicking me out. You know, and so um, luckily my staff sergeant at the time hooked me up and took me to medical and said that I had anger management problems. And I went to an anger management course. And so then it was all, then I went, took it the medical route, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but I learned from that course, it was like, don't drink. If you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, halt. Don't drink. You know, I don't drink now. Like, I don't drink at all. It doesn't work for me. I haven't drank for three years. I did 10 years not drinking in the military. But, like, don't drink if you have if oh, any of those things. And then because if you have trauma and then you drink on top of that, that it's bad yeah. recipe. So I stopped drinking right then and I basically isolated myself and I was like I'm not hanging out with anybody but myself and I'm going to train and be sober and so like that was July 2007-ish that that happened 
you know, and I went 10 years sober till 2017. So when I started that, I was training like crazy. When, for the last few months I was in Okinawa, I was doing like, you know, weighted vest runs for long, for endurance and like, you know, stuff like that in the heat and like trying to push and see how far, cause I was like, I was filling the void of partying and drinking and stuff with extreme training. Yeah. And, um, and also I was noticing transformation and I was like, I wanted to see how far I could push. And I was getting results on my stats, on my fitness scores, on all my, my pull-ups had doubled, like all this stuff. So I was like, you know, it was work. something was working. So when I got back, I actually, uh, that next, we did another workup and then we went to Iraq. And during that workup, um, I got in contact with this trainer in San Diego that was a mental focus coach. And that was a huge breakthrough for me. Cause, uh, you know, um, this guy uh, was from Spain and he was obsessed with mental focus. So he like had all these workouts and then he would end it with this, with some type of a mental focus thing. What, what would that look like? What's, what is a mental focus exercise? So uh, it would be, um, you know, like a run, you know, and he would, it would always be like a, a mind fuck kind of thing where he would, you know, tell you he's not, you're not going to know how far you're going to run. Okay. I'm just going to put my hazards on when it's time for you to slow, to jog or slow down. And when to turn them off and I drive, that means you run. Okay. And it's like, okay. And then that, and then um, going into... Uh, a gym workout. So we go to like 24 hour fitness, you know, and, uh, do high reps, low weight, you know, where it'd be like bench pressing 95 pounds, but do it 50 times. And then when you get to 50, he's going to go 30, 30 more. And then he might just keep doing, playing those games, you know, where he's like, boom, boom, boom. And so you do that. Then we go, you know, sometimes to the ocean, and do a swim, you know, and there's leopard sharks in, in La Jolla. So a, there's a lot of weird sharks in there that look like sharks that don't, aren't going to attack you. So it's not, I don't like swimming in that ocean, mm -hmm. but we would train there. And then we would go to the Kogan pool that I actually do a lot of professional athlete training now. And he would take me there and he would, uh, like, you know, cut me. He'd say, Hey, swim, um, a thousand meters on your stomach, swim a thousand uh, freestyle stroke, like do thousand breaststroke, thousand freestyle stroke, and then 500 backstroke and then get out of the pool. And like, I wasn't a technical swimmer at that point. So he's like, I'm like, so how do I just do it? Figure it out. Swimming, self-correcting anyway, just f do it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, why are you asking stupid questions? And, uh, so anyway, so then I do the swim and then it, the mental focus part would be back at the house, you know, and it's after a long day because this is after a day where a lot of these days I worked as an infantryman in the Marine Corps, waking up at 5 a.m., going out on a run, doing all the physical training, working all day and then driving to La Jolla after I'm off work and they cut us loose. That's when I started training with this guy. Wow. You're so I'm, dedicated. So Very I'm, dedicated. Yeah. So I, this is like midnight you know, some nights or like late at night and I still have an hour drive back to Camp Pendleton, you know, um, to Camp Horno. And so um, he, the last, the mental focus would be like holding out a stick, like a, a five pound to seven pound stick, you know, for time. Like, you know, hold it out for like an hour, you know. And, and so when I would start to hold it out, you know, your muscles are tired your mind starts to go like, dude, how long is this going to last? Like, I still have a drive. And all these tabs start to open, you know, mm -hmm. where you start to, like, focus on all these things that aren't going to do help you at all with holding the stick out. And then you go through all these emotions and kind of breakdowns and stuff. Sometimes I would, like, want to attack my trainer, you know. I would want to hit my, like, hit the stick against the wall, like, holding this out for 30, 40 minutes, you know. Like, and like, 
you know, all that stuff. And then like every single time at the end, it would be all that sh- sh- stuff would go away and it would just be full focus, like laser focus, holding this thing out. And he would come up and he would be like, you're done. And I'd be like, nah. And he'd be like, you're done, man. And he'd like, he'd start to like put it down and I'm like, you don't fucking tell me when I'm done, dude. Like, <laughs> you know, cause I was so focused. But that was a, uh, that was like an aha moment for me. It, but it would take me so long to get into that, right? That was all day of training and then five hours with this guy working and then holding the stick out. And it's like, dude, that's a long time. So that's why the underwater training is like the hack with that because it's, ment- you, it's immediate mental focus, right? Because you go into a survival situation because you need air. Yeah. And it's immediately like letting your panic, surrendering that panic and focusing, you know? And so like that focus that it takes to get to from 15 seconds holding your breath underwater to a minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes beyond, that's the same focus as holding out that stick at an hour and 15 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I love that. I love that. How long did you work with that guy for? aspect, huh? How long did you work with that guy for? Uh, probably two years. Yeah. You still talk Until to him? I went to, nah. Yeah. I haven't talked to him since I went, since I left to North Carolina to go to like Raider training. Oh. But for me, my motivation with all that too was I was going to Raider training. And at first I was going to force recon because when I came in, the Raiders wasn't established. I came in in 2005 and probably at the end of my first deployment, they started saying, hey, there's a MARSOC thing that they're going to start doing briefs for, you know? So when I got back from my first deployment, they had set up a trailer right across from the infantry battalion that they had a couple MARSOC recruiters. And um, I had a package to go to force, to go to recon, to, to go to uh, be a recon Marine. Was this after your first deployment or after your second deployment? So I was setting up the package to activate it after my second deployment, but I still had a Iraq deployment ahead of me. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm trying to follow the timeline. So let's. Yeah. So you you started doing this training with the mindset coach, the focus. 2007. Yeah. Coach, did you deploy to Iraq? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's not skip that. Yeah, yeah. So I deployed in 2008 to Iraq, and so that whole year up, I was training, and then I got a package. I had a package to go to recon. And my company commander at the time had had like a college friend or whatever that became a Raider team leader officer. So, and he was like at the forefront, right? So he was like, dude, I know you're thinking about going recon, but I really think that this is going to be the better move for you. So I'm going to make some pulls, make some moves and get you set up to go into this thing, you know? So he's, he got me. Uh, set up and then I went to the recruiters and then this guy helped me with all my paperwork my company commander so uh basically you know that was like a another Mr. Magoo thing because I was like clear focus going on recon I was running the pool uh helping run the pool at Camp Porno at the time and the re the recon like you know uh instructors and and recon training was at the pool all the time and I loved the culture of the recon yeah. group, you know? And, uh, and so, um, and the force recon guys, uh, my roommate was force recon and I was like, always asking him like, dude, I'm, I was just like, just blown away with like how much, you know, uh, how advanced the training was and like how, how much gear he had and all this different stuff that he was involved in and all of the skill sets that he had in force recon and stuff. And so I was pretty sold on that, you know, and, um, I, I gotta be honest. I'm surprised. I mean, how the hell did you even get in there? Because all the stuff that had happened to you before you were on just restriction, you'd yeah. gotten in fights, you had drinking incidents, you'd been not arrested, but brought back to the base with, by the police and whether all that, you know, the thing that happened with the Lieutenant, uh, 
you know, which I'm sure there was documentation of, which there didn't sound like it was just, but nobody else knows that. You know, they just see what's in your file. Yeah. What, 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 I mean. How did I bounce back? Yeah. How did you, in a, in a short amount of time? <sighs> yeah. Um, well, another thing, there's, there's two parts I want to make sure I hit. The first part it has to do with my grandmother. And then um, the second part was I got meritoriously promoted for my performance. Once I was sober, I was like, okay. People, they were, I, I caught up with my peers. I got promoted re- really quickly after that, you know. But in the Marine Corps, like, they can meritoriously promote you pretty much all the way to staff sergeant to E6. And then E6 is when all that stuff catches back up with you. So, like, all my trouble that I got into. But even for my trouble, I got boarded. They boarded me when I went through selection for my alcohol related incidents. And okay. All that. Like, they ne- that never goes away. Okay. So like, you know, and then on all my, like, on all my stuff that they're tracking, you know. Yeah. With all your, you know, but uh, but my grandmother, whenever I was getting out, you know, my grandparents have always been like very foundational in everything that I've done, um, and my grandmother was like, hey, um, I was telling her I think I'm gonna get kicked out. And she was like, you can change your life. You can turn it around, you know, but you're going to have to believe it, you know. She, like, coached me through that shit. No kidding. Because nobody believed in me. Everybody turned on me. You know, in the military, when they turn on you, it's like a pack, pack mentality. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes that happens, dude. And uh, my grandmother was like, you know, she taught me like, believe you gotta believe in your mind that this shit's gonna, that this stuff's gonna materialize for you, and you're gonna make it happen, and you're gonna manifest it, you're gonna create it, you know. And so, you know, she would just talk to me about stuff like that and tell me to do like vision boards and stuff like that. Do you know what that is? Yeah, I know what a vision board is. Simply like, you know, just taking Google images and putting them in a collage or taking images from your life or something or whatever it is that you're envisioning that you want to see happen. And so I started doing stuff like that that I'd never done before, you know. You still do that? Yeah. (laughs) Interesting. What's on your vision board right now? Like Olympics, you know, um... Stuff about global impact, you know, um, family, circle, like, I care a lot about all my people that are, that I, you know, are in my life. Yeah. So your grandma coached you? My grandma coached me, yeah. And I still talk to my grandma almost every day, you know. (laughs) That's uh, cool, man. And, uh, you know, General McChrystal said, because I was at a speaking thing right when I got out and with General McChrystal, and uh, someone asked about all the research that they did around people that quit special operations training. And he was saying that they did all this research, you know, millions of dollars into this, you know. And the biggest takeaway that they had was that the people that make it through the soft pipeline, they 100% make up their mind before they start that they're going to make it to the end and they don't know what it's going to be like, you know, but they 100% decide. And for me, I do that. I, I, I do that like, but it's because my grandmother. So before I ever went into any pipeline or selection or anything, I would talk to my grandparents and I would tell my grandmother like, Hey, I'm going into this thing, into this training, you know, like where I'm not going to have like, or like, you know, and she'd say, well, you know, like before Sears school or hell week or something like that, like, well, you know, you're going to be good, right? Like, what are you worried about? What are you, what are they going to have you do? Well, you know, you're not going to sleep for this amount of time. Well, you know, you can do that. Like, what's that bother you? And then, you know, well, you're going to go without food. Well, just eat like, you know, eat heck, double mint, eat double meals till you go out there. Like, then you won't even need food for a few days, you know, like whatever. It's just... She just reinforces stuff, and uh, and then she asked me, 
you know you'll never quit, right? And I say, no, nah, I won't. And then I make up my mind. I have that accountability with her to where now I'm when I'm in hell week or whatever, like, and it's shitty weather on day four, five, six. Like, it doesn't matter. I, I made up my mind and everything way before this. And I have accountability with my grandmother. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. So that works for me. And any, I think it works for everybody that I work with and coach from my experience. If they have that accountability system in their life, that really works. And that can get them through the hardest, you know, challenges and whatever it is that they're, you know, yeah. navigating. Deployment. Deployment. What, Iraq? Yeah, your first deployment. It's a trip, man. Iraq is such a crazy, you know, place. Uh, it's like you could tell. It's just, just such a historical place, kind of biblical type thing that had been through war and there was trash everywhere. That was overwhelming, you know. But that deployment was very interesting because we were like living out of vehicles and we were turning everything over to the Iraqis. What year was this? 2008. The end of the Iraq. That was happening already? OIF. Where we were turning the, everything over to them? Yeah. Yeah, so it was interesting. Like, you know, it was kind of a training deployment again. Um, uh, there were people, there were Marines that got killed. There were uh, none, like, in my platoon or anything, but there were, uh, that was like a, when we were driving around the cities, there was an RKG-3 threat. You remember that? I don't even know what an RKG-3 is. I don't know. That's a little shape charge on a parachute, bro. Okay. They throw over the wall, and they have a spotter. Oh. And so, like, they were hitting, like, the rear Vic with the machine gunner or whatever. They find the vehicle, the convoys with the soft targets and they try to hit them, you know. But um, there were people getting cut up with those. Um, and so it's still real combat environment. We got IDF'd. Yeah. Indirect, you know, missiles. Like, you know, and then, oh, where's the point of origin site? Let's all rush over there. And then, oh, let's go get the Iraqi police to help out. Well, the, it's like. Yeah. They're all tied in. Yeah, dude. So it's a waste of time. Um, but uh, but anyway, uh, so it wasn't like, you know, I got shot at a few times, I think, from the Syrian border. We weren't allowed to shoot back, you know, like gunshot. Yeah. And I don't know, dude. It wasn't like so it was it, night and day from the Afghan deployment, you know. Yeah. So uh, it was a little bit kind of like... Uh, it's like, dude, when I got to my infantry platoon, when I first got in that first day before I even went to the sniper and dock, they had all gotten back from Iraq and they were all giving us like horror stories. They didn't let us sleep that first night. And they were all telling us like, you know, when that grenade comes over the wall, are you going to be able to get over? Are you going to be, are you going to be able to get your buddy over? I don't think you will. I was able to get over. And then they leave go back to drinking and then someone else comes in and tells you something like, you know, basically they're like scared, trying to, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're, but so anyway, I'm like, dude, when does this shit like, let, like stop playing the whole, cause the whole time that this whole, and then in the Marine Corps boot camp, dude, it's kill, 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 da, 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 da. They train you, you know, and then they also train you like with minimal use of force. You know, you go through a MCMAP, like martial arts program, and they give you these warrior ethos things, minimal use of force, da 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 da, escalation of force, like warrior mindset stuff. But then there's this proven, prove yourself in combat, kind of check in the box that's implied there, right? Yeah. Especially in like a combat in the infantry. So then our first deployment, dude, we were there for a year in Okinawa, and these senior guys were still talking about the Iraq stuff the whole time and holding it over us. It's like, dude, it's not our... We didn't choose to come to Okinawa and come on all these training missions, dude. But now it's over us. Now we're going back, and they're going to hold it over us again for another year. And then we go to Iraq, and now we're in Iraq, and it's nothing like... What was there, you know, so then now we get back and it's like, 
you know, and you're kind of like, but it's be careful what you wish for, you know? Yeah. Because you wish for combat and then you get in the middle of that and it's like, what the fuck is this? You know? So, but in the Iraq deployment, that was uh, enough for me with the infantry to where I was so motivated at that point to never be on a, in the infantry for another day that I was going to make it through selection. Like I was, I was going to perform and I was like, dude, I don't even care. I'm not great at land nav or any of this other shit. I'll make it work. Cause I know I'm not going to fucking come back. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. I had like a, I had a staff sergeant, you know, and I'm like a corporal at that time, squad leader, you know, and I had a great relationship with like my lieutenant, but my staff sergeant, I didn't, you know? So when my lieutenant got promoted and got sent out, this guy starts trying to put paperwork on me and burn me for things like, you know, like I took some toe straps because I'm training for selection. I took some toe straps that were in the burn pit and I hooked them up to this thing and I started using it to pull it back and forth and they were going to try to like, like I stole government equipment it's taking this thing out of the burn pit. And then, you know, I was working with a lot of the vehicles were down and it's like, because I went outside of my chain of command and got the vehicles fixed, he wanted to give me paperwork. And it was like, for taking that's, initiative, dude, that's the kind of like, but like burn me, dude. Like I had, shouldn't and, it be the opposite? Shouldn't you be? Yeah. Getting rewarded for taking initiative because I'm, Betting there probably aren't a whole lot of people in the infantry who take the initiative. See, that's the that's the catch twenty two, dude. Is that it's like honor, courage, and commitment. But if you're honor and courageous, and you stand up and you're against the status quo or the group thought or the pack, then like or the conventional mindset. Or you want to better yourself out of that? Yeah. That creates a lot of jealousy in units like that. Uh, yes. It's a bucket of crabs. Which is ridiculous because he could have fucking done it too. He yeah. could have bettered himself. He could have went to selection, but he was too much of a pussy to do it. So <laughs> let's fuck Prime over. So he's going to put paperwork on me. Yeah. And they even got it to where, like, you know, just stupid shit. Like, you know, we're on our one of our last patrols and they're, we're in a patrol brief, you know. And... uh they're like the new officer that we just got at the end of the <coughs> at the end of deployment. It's all motivated, right? It's like, dude, it's almost comical. Yeah. An intel officer gets to be a uh, you know um, infantry officer, super motivated. Hats off to him. But it's the last couple of weeks of deployment. We don't care. Yeah. You know, like all that stuff, and so. Um, he was doing a patrol brief <laughs> before we go on a patrol <laughs> and, uh, you know, was like, why aren't you taking notes to me? And it's like, well, I'm going, to, we're going to the same, like, I have the same role that I've had for a year and a half on this patrol. It's literally couldn't be more textbook. And also, you know, and he's like, well, what are you going to do if shit hits the fan? And I was like, so you're you so you think that if shit hits the fan on the patrol, that I would pull out my right in the rain notebook and revert to what my notes are here in the patrol brief to like make decisions. Is that what you're saying? And everybody's laughing, right? And then this guy looks like an idiot. So then we go on the patrol, and by the time we're coming back in, they're calling me to go report in to the company command for like they're trying to get me for disrespecting an officer kind of thing. Like, ruin my career, all this shit. Yeah. Like, immediate opportunity. So that's that whole vibe and everything. And luckily, dude, I had an open-door policy with my company commander. This is why that guy was an idiot, too, the staff sergeant. Because the guy, this is the guy that's got me into MARSOC. So he's like, dude, you're not getting any negative paperwork, period. Just keep doing your thing. And they would take me to this, and then he would, like, kick it, like... Okay, got it, da, da, da. And then tell me, like, dude, you're good. He was the one that helped me get in, you know? So then I just had to ride, ride that out. And then whenever I got back, luckily my buddy hooked me up with a job at the pool 
when I got back from Iraq. The Horno Pool. <sighs> so, um, you know, everything happens for a reason, dude. Yeah, no kidding. You want to take a quick break? Sure, whatever you want. Yeah, let's take a break. Hey guys, let me tell you about this subscription service that I've been working real hard on called Vigilance Elite Patreon. Basically on Patreon, we have it broken up into three different tiers. We got tier one, tier two, and tier three. Let's dive in. Our tier one patrons get all the behind the scenes footage of the Sean Ryan show. That could include behind the scenes photos, that could be side conversations that we have in between breaks, that could be specific questions that our patrons give us for the guest on the Sean Ryan show, and a ton of bonus content that doesn't really fit into any specific category. For our tier two patrons, they get access to our tactical training library, which consists of well over a hundred videos. We've broken those videos up into separate categories, and those categories are rifle fundamentals, pistol fundamentals, drills, tactics, driving, gear and weapon setups, and everybody's favorite, mindset. Also on Tier 2, you will get a live update from me on the 1st and the 15th of every month where we talk about the upcoming guests on the Sean Ryan Show, plus all the benefits of Tier 1. Our top tier, which is Tier 3, gets full access to all the other tiers, plus they get full access to me where we do video teleconferencing, VTC, once a month. We discuss anything from tactics to current events to who's coming on the show. I take suggestions and it's very interactive. No matter what tier you choose, the support is greatly appreciated and it is the only thing that makes this show drive on. So thank you for all the support. See you on Patreon. All right, Prime, we're back from the break. We're getting into train up for the Marine Raider program, MARSOC. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, getting to be at the pool, uh, going right before selection, I was getting a lot of information, you know, because people are coming to the pool to train, you know, before selection and, and after training for ITC. So I was getting good information I guess like at least a little information um, but I didn't really know what to expect going to selection besides what I had read about Army Special Forces selection you know yeah um, that's all you were going off of was the armies module. yeah and then like whatever feedback I got from people because what they'll tell you you know and I wasn't you know you know what I mean yeah like, you you're trying to get get information from them, but you you also, it's not really cool to be like, yo, tell me like how you know. It's like, hey, is there anything that you can tell me, or like, what would you tell me to get ready, kind of thing. Yeah. You know, but it's not like, hey, what happened when you got off the bus here? You know. Yeah. Like that kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but if you're worried about that kind of stuff, you're you might already be working against yourself. Mm -hmm. Um. But anyway, uh, where are we go where were we going? Selection, right? We're going to selection. We're going to selection. Marine Special Forces. You're taking us with you. Yeah, Marine Special Operations Assessment Selection Course um, was honestly the most professional course ever, dude. Like, I was so blown away. Like nobody's nobody yelled at you. Nobody talked to you. Besides, if you were like, if you needed an instruction. Or if you need an instruction retold to you, but it's very neutral and they're all in a role, you know, and you get all your instructions from the whiteboard 
and there's no talking amongst candidates. Hmm. You How know many people I mean? are there? Huh? How many people were there? I don't know. Maybe like 80. 80? Yeah. How long is selection? A month or like uh, three three weeks-ish. Um, now it's longer because they have a pre-selection course. So I think there's an extra six weeks because there's a prep course. Okay. Before you go to selection. So walk us through. What's Walk us through selection. Well, um, you know, uh, you got to get trained. There's all these like training programs to do before you go there. A lot of that's tactical stuff, you know. But um, going basically... Uh, there's a, a first phase where you have to meet all of the criteria. This is like when you're still at, at the, in North Carolina, okay. you're still at Stone Bay, like at the main Marsoc base. And they make sure that you can meet your 12 mile ruck time, your PFT, like your physical fitness test and your combat fitness test and your swim and all these things. And once all that's checked off, they weed out anybody that didn't meet that, and then all these get on the bus, and they go up to selection. Oh, God. <clears throat> and so... Um, so is selection the actual training course for MARSOC Raiders, Marine Raiders, or is it a selection to get into the bingo. training course? Okay. Yeah. If you think that you're in at that point... You're, you're sadly mistaken. All right. Um, but it is. So anyway, but that's how you get in. Um, and uh, so uh, I, lo I loved a lot of it, you know, because it was like big boy rules for the first time in the Marine Corps. Nobody's telling me anything. I just have to take my instructions from the whiteboard and I don't have to talk to anyone. And I'm introverted, so I can do 30 days, you know, like. So like loan operator yeah. kind of thing. And it'll be a recharge for me in some ways, you know. Yeah. But some people can't handle that kind of thing because they're real extrovert, like dependent on external communication. So that might be a challenge for some people that we that you know, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh so knock that out, go up to selection, and then that's where it's like land nav every day, you know, point to point, you know, drop off. You're basically in the van, you know. Uh, you're in a van. You get put in with a group. Nobody talks to each other. You drive around in circles. They drop you off. You start navigating that day. When you get to the a point that they tell you to get it back in the van, you get back in the van. They drive you around in circles. Sometimes they take you back home. Sometimes they take you into a, a scenario, you know. What kind of scenario? You know, just like a, kind of like a tactical decision slash cultural problem solving, you know, where you got like the psychs and everybody's evaluating you, your decision making and stuff. Yeah. And, um, and so... Uh, you know, you do all those games and then you go back and you, every night that you go back, that's what's interesting about selection that creates the urgency to perform. Because every night you go back, there's people missing from their beds, you know, and you're like, damn, dude, that's a lot. In Like, we lost a lot from yesterday to today. Like, how many did you lose on the first day? Huh? How many people did you lose on the first day? I don't really know, but it's just like... Uh, you just, it's, but it's enough, you know. It's just, yeah, you start noticing, like, because people get caught up on the route at Land Nav. This guy lost his rifle. You got to have your rifle on you at all times. He showed up to a checkpoint with no rifle. He quit when he got there. Gone. Rack empty. You know, bed empty, all his stuff gone. This person, like, you know, what, I, dude, it's just, it's random. But yeah. it's like, you know, um, but that creates like to where, and you're not talking, you're not communicating a lot. Obviously you communicate with people that, you know, like you could do that without even talking, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, it's like, damn people, this is real. People are leaving literally like we're 
a week away from being done or something like that, and people are still leaving, you know? And so it's like, damn, I got to show, you know, stretch tonight, get yeah. all my stuff ready for tomorrow. So is it all land nav? No, it was land nav, and then it's team, you know. Uh, How's it broken up? Uh, it's broken up into, uh, yeah, initial, like, um, the initial uh, standards phase, and then you get on the bus, you go to selection, you do land nav phase, and then towards the end you're doing team week, you know where it's you're in a team and you have all these like impossible you know challenges that you have to solve and someone's in charge i mean they're ch- they're solvable but they're you know whatever that's critical thinking is involved and you have all these problems that you solve and you have to carry out these weights or do these different things as a team and you have to be evaluated as a leader and as a team member You know? Yeah. So if you're someone that can lead, but then whenever you're put as a team member, you can't be in a team because you keep trying to lead or you keep discrediting or undermining everything that the leadership's doing, it doesn't work either. Can't. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So you got to be evaluated as both and you got to learn how to operate in both. So anyway, do that. And a lot of that's like heavy weight, you know? So now it's like weighing on your body a lot because it's like you got to. You've been carrying a pack with all this stuff. You've met your 12 mile times. So you've had to ruck a lot. And then you've been land naving and running on your land navs to make your points a lot. And so like towards the end, and then you're carrying all this weight as a team and all the team events, you're carrying a thousand pounds and this and that and all this stuff. And so, you know, there are guys that got injured that were good guys that we helped make through the event. If that, does that make sense? Yeah. Makes perfect sense. So it's doable. It's all doable. And if you're, a, if people like you, then you're going to like, they'll work as a team to support you. And that's how it works in a real, in a team. Yeah. Um, but uh, so that's where I met my partner, Don Tran, too. That's like my partner with UTL and Deep End Fitness and all the stuff that I've been doing. He's your business partner and He's your my best friend. Partner. Yeah. We call him the Asian Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> so you move, so you get through selection. What does the end look like? Um, you know, uh, how many guys made it through? Dude, the end was dicey for me because Don and all these guys, my buddy Camp and whoever else that was there, they got selected. You know, immediate. Like we're all in the barracks, right? And they come in. The instructor, he a list of names move out to here, get on this bus. Boom. That's all the people that you know didn't get selected. This list of names go out to this bus. That's all my buddies. That's Don and all these guys, camp, all these guys, they got selected. All these people that didn't get your name called remain in the barracks and you're going to be pulled out this afternoon for boarding. You know, so I got boarded. It was all for my alcohol related issues. But basically, I just had to, like, I was in there with all these guys that were getting boarded, and they were all for stuff that I was like, get away from me, you know? Yeah. I am not like you. I do not want to be in the same, because they were all, like, worried, and da 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 and I was like, no. I, like, you know, so I went in and got boarded, and I got grilled for my stuff, but I had enough time and sobriety at that point and proof of performance that I could answer those questions. And so I had to like, you know, and dude, I've been boarded, you know, in other things in life, you know, and that's a good experience, you know? So I got, I got boarded in there and it sucked going through that. Cause I wish, obviously I would just gotten on the bus that I got selected, but like that was another just training thing. Yeah. You know, training scenario. So got through that, got selected. Did they tell you at the board that you, all right, you're good to go at the end of the board? Yes. How'd that feel? Uh, mission, like accomplishment, you know? Nice. Yeah. And I do, I do that stuff. Like I was, a lot of my, like 
my drive with that stuff is for my grandparents, you know, to make my grandparents proud. Because it's like, I don't really get a lot. Like, I don't feel a lot of, oh, like, when I connect it to me, it doesn't really matter. But when I connect it to my grandparents, it, it actually matters. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying. None of my medals or awards or anything mean anything connected to me. But they make my grandparents proud. Yeah. And, like, dude, that's all that matters, like, to me in that stint. So, um, but I felt accomplished going through that because I was like, damn, dude. Because if you think about it, I went from not being able to join, like thinking I wasn't able to join, getting in, going through waivers, going through almost getting kicked out of the Marine Corps, getting meritoriously promoted back up. And then now I got selected. So I was like, damn, I actually have like a shot. Like I made it out from the, from the bottom, you know, like I actually have a shot, like, you know, and, uh, and everything, all my training and all the mental focus stuff and all the reps that I put in, it all paid off. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I actually had a lot of inner confidence going in, moving forward. And, uh, and it was also like a self mastery thing, you know, like I was like facing my fears, like my fear of heights, all these different things that I have, you know, like going forward, leaning in. Like I never thought I could shoot like that, you know, Yeah. or do the, do those things. It's scary to think like, dude, that's way out of my comfort zone. I could never run and have two guns and doing that and that and that. And it's like, yeah, dude, if you train, like, you know, and so, um, you know, <clears throat> when I, so I've got back to after selection, right. And I worked at the pool and we were trying to get a slot immediate to ITC, which was individual training course, which was new at the time, but that's like our buds okay, you know, or our Q course for army special forces. And, um, so anyway, I was, we were trying to get an immediate slot and we looked like we were, and then we weren't. So some of the guys that went to selection with us, they went right into ITC a month or two later. And then for us, we went like 10 months later or almost a year later, which meant that we got an extra 10 or 11 months to train at the pool which was as a group, me, Don, and Camp, before we went to ITC together. And so that was like, that was it, you know, because we were like working as instructors at the pool, but we were just training, dude. Yeah. We were training, we we're doing underwater stuff, pushing our barriers, doing putting all the weights in the pool, doing underwater walks and all this stuff that we do now. And like, you know, running on the hills of Camp Pendleton, going to the gym, you know, uh, just all day training, dedicated to training. That's why it was so important to get out of the infantry thing because they'll just keep you doing, like, fire watch and play little working party games and stuff like that. You will never have time to train if they have, you know, that's what you were saying earlier because it warms their heart to know that they're holding you back from, like, you moving forward. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have you doing extra Bullshit, you know what I'm saying? So you got to get out. So I found it out, and I got to assigned to the pool. So now the infantry couldn't touch me. That was step one, you know. Yeah. Um, but the pool is a temporary job in the Marine Corps. It's only for people transitioning from one job to another, getting out, and you have to have a swim qualification in order to get in there. And then if you go to water survival instructor course, then you have like a locked in job there mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying yeah so i went there to mcquist uh water instructor or water survival instructor course and that's where i really learned a lot about the technical aspects of swimming and how to coach and train you know and then whenever i got it's a three-week course dude so you retain what you retain but when i came back to the pool and now i'm running swim qualifications with large groups and stuff now that like and that was kind of like i had to that was outside of my comfort zone at first and i had to get break into that but like dude doing that 
um, that's what taught me how to train because I would have people that are non-swimmers that I would have to get through the qual. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I would want I wouldn't want to burn them and just have them check out as an unqualified. I want to try to get them through. That's what everybody you you want to hook them up. Mm-hmm. Marine to Marine, it's like you don't want to at the end of the day that you burned a bunch of Marines. Never. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we were talking about this last night. Yeah. You got, you got those instructors who have a chip on their shoulder, they have an ego, and unfortunately there are a lot of people that could have made great Marines or great Raiders or great SEALs or great Green Berets, and because they're on an ego trip, a lot of guys don't make it, you know, through that pipeline. With that being said, you know what I mean, I'm not... It need the course needs to be hard. Yeah. There needs to be you need to pay your way into a unit like that. But with some of the stuff that we were talking about last night, like some of the kind of nonsense type hazing or or you know, the personality conflicts. There's so many people that would have made a phenomenal operator that never got the opportunity because some chick at the bar thought that guy was cute instead of that guy that guy holds a grudge and he has the keys to where you want to go and throws them in the trash you know and it wastes it's unfortunate you know not only did you fuck that individual over you fucked the entire country over because that guy would have made a phenomenal operator and you're a cheese dick and you couldn't let your fucking ego go to let that guy through yeah you know and there's a lot of that shit that happens all all throughout the military you know yeah unfortunately but and uh and then but you're the guy that helps everybody succeed because everybody's got to get the swim call qual no matter <laughs> what you know and so rather than see the same guy come through five or six times cuz he can't swim you know you're the guy that takes him aside and shows him hey man maybe if you do this you know you might hit the time yeah and it's uh and there's safety aspects involved too, because it's like there's a 30 foot high tower, and so they have to jump off the high tower in certain qualifications. And if they're scared of heights, you might have to throw them off, like launch them, yeah. so that they don't grab the rail and then fall and hit their head or something. And so there's safety aspects of it too, but like it's a very looking back at it, I never would have ever seen this while I was in. But looking back now, it was an invaluable experience to work, to have so many reps working with people with their fear of water or mm-hmm. heights. Yeah. And like being able to coach or f- get those reps. So I started to get really obsessed with. Um, so during the pool, there was a couple aha things, right, that happened. One was seeing that when you could take someone's focus off of themselves and you could put it on something else like the torpedo you know, or like whatever it is. That's why I take the torpedo and and taught so many people to swim for the first time, just getting them to trust you, get in the water, see the torpedo, can you just pass this with me a few times and then swim towards me and then move across the pool and then they just swam for the first time. But like instructors that are not comfortable going down to 15 feet and then you now you have something and they're going down to get the torpedo, they can go down to 15 feet. If you ask them just to go down and touch it, they can't. You see what I'm saying? That's yeah. an aha moment. Mm-hmm. So, like, when you put your focus on something, you can unlock a lot of results and get it off of yourself and your own fears and anxiety and all that shit. Interesting. There was another aha moment. Aha. Uh, uh-huh. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> what was uh, that? No, there was another aha moment when was playing this game, underwater football that we called, uh, where we would use um, a torpedo underwater with two teams or we would use a weight or we would use a dive brick and the goal is to score is to touch the other wall but it's underwater so you have to pass the dive brick or the weight or the torpedo blah 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 and get it to the other side and so that i saw a lot of like people really get into that and that unlocks a lot of performance and confidence playing that game especially with the torpedo because then it's very dynamic and it's fast paced and it can go almost halfway across the pool in like two seconds. Okay. So then that really keeps your attention because the thing's moving like a fish, you know? Yeah. So then like, 
and they make them bright colors and stuff like that. Like the R's are camo, you know, that are bright colored, but it's like to keep your attention. Um, uh, so the underwater football game, that was like my favorite thing, you know? And so we would play that at the Horno pool as instructors. If we had three on three or four on four, we were playing and we were waiting till we had three on three or four on four of like the good players. Then we were going to battle, right? And having these fun games and everybody was getting massively better with their water confidence with each game, everybody like full confidence. And so it was like, why doesn't this exist? Kind of like that's the initial part, right? Like this is awesome. Yeah. Then when we went to training, you know, cause like, a lot of, you know, I don't know if, if this is like this for everybody, but for me, like I was, you know, relatively fast and in really top shape in the infantry with all the training I was doing. My endurance was like on a completely different level than anyone else, you know, like we would come back from the gym or come back from like the hikes, you know, we do these hikes on Friday where you set, start at like three or 4 a.m. and you go hike the big mountains at Camp Pendleton and all these people fall out and you help them up the mountain and then, you know, everybody helps them out and then we get to the top and then we go down, you know, and by the end of it, people just go and crash, you know, and like rehydrate and whatever. And, and, uh, you know, I was it, with the mental focus stuff, like I would literally just get my pack down and go to the gym, you know, and I would love to know that everybody else went to sleep. Yeah. And I'm just like, it's not really getting value of being at the gym at that point, but it's just like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so where were we? Well, let's move into, we got it. You went to work at the pool, worked on your swimming, taught a lot of people. Now you're going into ITC. Going into ITC and dude, I'm so slow, man. I'm the slowest runner, you know? So I find that out real quick that I'm at the back of the pack with running and, uh, you know, um, and that's what's different from being at the uh, infantry unit. Like, I'm fast, I'm, everything's easy, and now I'm, like, at the back, so everything's hard. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm challenged to keep up with runs, and we're going to run every day, for, like, pretty much for 10 months. And so when we get there, you know... We get into it, and uh, the first day, that's like, this is like admin week, you know? Um, uh, this is when we dropped. We started with like, you know, somewhere from like 90 to 100 candidates and or students, and we dropped a lot in admin week. I don't know, remember how many, but, dude, this first run that we took off on was like a serious reality check because it was just like... Um, you know, we're all in the classroom and then, hey, get outside. And then we take off on this run. And it's like, you know, instructor passes off to instructor. So they're not really mm -hmm. getting a workout, but you're getting smoked. And at each station, you're doing something like bear crawls or, you know, lunges or something. And like, you know, and then you're running to the next thing. Then you're doing sprints and then, you're you know, and they got you. And it was like, you know. North Carolina, hot, uh, like, uh, you know, I remember putting my head in a mud hole, like, you know, for water just to cool off at some point. But I was like, people were quitting and it was like chaos at the beginning, right? And I remember feeling like this sucks because I know I, I'm going to be last on runs and shit like that, but I'm going to have to fucking just do that you know yeah i have to do that like if that's what i have to do like whatever and what the class proctor who was amazing guy came up and his saying to all of us was uh be hard be humble and always push the fight you know and sometimes i think about that like once a week in my life when i have shit you know yeah it's a good grounding but that guy was awesome. He was from Boston, too. Nice. Um, but anyway, he came up and he was like, dude, on day zero, like running next to me, he was like, you're good. I was sucking, dude. He's like, you're good. And calm as fuck. 
<laughs> he's like, if you just keep going, you're good. You never quit. You know, you got this. And I was like, boom. And I was, that was it, dude. So for the rest of that was that on top of having my buddy Don and my buddy camp, that's how I got through ITC, you know? Um, cause I was slow, dude. If I was on officer standards, I don't think I would have not made it, you know? And, um, you know, and, uh, a lot of that shit, like a lot of those, t uh, run standards, you know, they're good, they're good standards. Uh, and dude, they, you gotta have standards like that in, in that environment. Um, but like in, operational environment you need you got to carry a lot of weight you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and so the run times don't matter in operational environment and so it's like you you know that's kind of how i look at it a little yeah. bit because it's like you need guys that can carry weight too so the run times but um but anyway i'm not making i can't make any excuses i was slow dude because i when i came in you know i weighed 180 pounds when I came into the Marine Corps. By the time I got to Marsoc, I was like 220. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, I was packing extra weight. It's like running with a weight vest on. Yeah. You know, it's not efficient. Um, so, How's the training pipeline broken up there? Uh, it's like... What are the phases? You know, I don't know. I'm not... Like, I got out five years ago, just full transparency, so I'm not too up to speed on exactly, but what for mine, it was or it was uh, broken up into a bunch of different courses, which I'm still sure is still is to an extent. But uh, so you get there and it's like, um, you know, admin, like uh, weed people out and uh, field uh, skills phase initial field skills and whatever and uh kind of like stuff that feeds into hell week kind of environment or raider spirit is what we call it um and uh and so um and then seer school you know and uh and then field uh field skills evaluation like help like raider spirit like a final exercise yeah, but there's also, like, leading up to that, there's actually, like, amphib, too. Okay. So you have, like, all your pull tust out, and then they take you, if you're lucky, to Key West. And uh, so, like, we got to go to Key West and uh, go train out there at the, uh, damn, dude, I don't the name of the acronym of it, but it's the Army SF Dive School yeah. area back there in Key West at Fleming Key. And I, was, I just got to go back there with the... Uh, with the uh, veteran challenge, the oh cool, the wounded veteran challenge, yeah, um, to do that dive uh, thing. So, um, but I'm, but anyway, so we we went to Amphib, did all that stuff. Amphib was awesome, man. Being in Key West, um, that was really fun, and uh, and getting to get out of North Carolina. I did not like North being in North Carolina, dude. <laughs> I was like, you know. I'm from South, I'm from like a uh, beach town area in Texas and stuff. And then I'm living, I like California and now I'm in, you know, North Carolina. So I was like, dude, I got to get back to, I wanted to get stationed at first MSOB. That was my, that was what I, my goal was. Hold on. You're just going way ahead. Yeah. Let's stick with Marsoc. <laughs> no, no, that, that's my, that's the unit that I was trying to get into. Yeah. We're still in. But I'm at school. We're still at IDC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're at Sear. We go to Amphib. We go to Raider Spirit. How many guys are washing out? Uh, dude, we washed out all the teams down to two teams. And we were just like, you know, we graduated like maybe 12 or 13 of the original OGs. That's it? That's it. From 100? Yeah. From Very 90 to 100 ROI. people? Yeah. We had like... Uh, you know, badass guys that were like coming in from other classes that maybe got injured or had something, whatever, where they came recycled into our class. So we plus back up to, you know, 20 or something like that. You know what I mean? But, yeah. but most of us, you know, uh, and it was still fairly new kind of 
pipeline, so it wasn't, you know. Yeah, you were one of the first classes, right? Uh, yeah, I think we were the fifth class. Okay. So it felt pretty a lot gu- of changing. like guinea pigs, Yeah. you know, um, which uh, has its advantages, too. You know, has its disadvantages and has its advantages, Yeah. you know. <clears throat> so you get through ITC. Where are you going after that? Uh, going to 1st MSOP, 1st uh, Marine Special Operations Battalion at the time. Um, and, uh, which later became first Raider battalion. So that's, that's like, so you go to a brand new training course, right? The, the ITC, cause you're the fifth, you're only the fifth class to go through it. So they're still working things out there. Working some kinks out. Yeah. In the program. Some major kinks, <laughs> I'm sure. And then you show up at, I'm sorry, what was it? First? First. Yeah. And that's a brand new unit as well. Correct. Because if there's only been five courses of ITC. So that's interesting. Because, like, so the unit was already st- stood up and it was built off of the backs of recon and force recon guys. Okay. And so, you know, when we got to our unit, there were guys that had gone to selection, you know, that were force recon guys that went to selection and then they were raiders. There were a lot of guys that, that were forced recon that were in leadership positions that they flipped into raiders, you know, that didn't go to selection or anything. That were like, they were the guys that led us through combat and stuff like that. And so phenomenal, like, you know, so there were guys that were raiders that were transitioned from force recon into being a raider. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, kind of like an they honorary, were like, in. Hey, you're good. They were grandfathered in, and on, and from my knowledge, there was only like a handful total, because because then they went through this formal process of like we got an MOS 0372 Marines Critical Skills Operator, um, and so that's MARSOC, you know, Special Operations, and mm-hmm. uh, once we got that, then like you know, they they had to assign everybody that rated it the MOS, and they're all the guys that were. Force Recon had been through all of these schools that got it, that warranted it. There were only a handful that that got it that hadn't been through any schools. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. They got grandfathered in, and it was like, maybe it was an accident, maybe it wasn't. But either way, that's not, you don't really, from my thing, you really don't want to get grandfathered in to something like that or accidentally show up on the bus, and now you're at first MSOB. You know, and now you're deploying with the team to like Hellman. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, dude, you want to go to the training that sets you up to be at that place. That makes sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I saw people overseas in situations that was way out of their like pay out of their training scope. You know, like a medic that was supposed to be working at medical, taking temperature, or doing basic medical like check-in type admin type medic stuff and they're in the, they're in a mass casualty in an enemy village yeah you know they're trying to take your vitals yes. blood pressure temperature maybe check your ears and now they're slapping tourniquets giving yeah. crikes putting in every day pharyngeals. every day damn you know and it's like you see stuff you see them do stuff that way off baseline yeah <laughs> Um, so what was check-in like? I mean, it's a relatively new unit. Yeah. There's not a lot of culture inside of it, I wouldn't I wouldn't think. It was, dude. Was there really? It How was. long it had been stood up? Well, it's for? West Coast. Uh, you know, uh, the pl- it was like plank holders, and we're, you know, like, they'd been deploying to Afghanistan. Okay. Repeatedly. So um, they started in, you know, 2000 eight 2009 trailers you know working out of trailers and then they built the unit so when i got out there it was like the nice building okay you know that we're actually like moving into we had facilities and like it was it was like checking into the nfl cool in the marine corps and like whoa this is a completely different world like i remember uh you know one of my leaders that, that I ended up on a team with a couple of times, like I showed up and he was like, you know, he pulled up in a muscle car 
fully tatted out, like hands, like cre- like grease back hair, not nothing in Marine Corps regulation. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it's just like, whoa. And he's got, you know, like a green badge coming in. Like, it's like, whoa. And they're like, yeah, dude, that guy. And then, you know, you start, and then it's like, these guys are like, you know, uh, the way that I looked at those senior guys at that point, it's like, dude, these are, that's who you want to emulate, you know, and looking at the guys that were the fallen guys that had the paddles in the hallway and like looking at these senior guys walking around and they didn't stop for a second. You know, some of them did and they're like, dude, like we're going to have a team thing this weekend. You new guys need to get out there, you know, or whatever. And they were like, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it was like, it wasn't like, Hey, like they didn't even give a shit because they didn't know what ITC was. They don't care. They've been deploying to Hellman back to back. Like our executive officer has no legs and he's deploying again with us. Holy shit. That was shit. the fucking environment. You know. That's some heavy stuff to walk into. Yes. And uh, you know, dude, one of one another thing was I had a, a girlfriend, right? And this is leaving ITC getting to there. And, uh, you know, it was a lot of drag through ITC, having a long distance relationship and then, but thought that this thing was going to materialize. And then when we, before we got out, they said, Hey, do not get a house, do not get anything, be ready to be a combat replacement and, you know, check in and be ready for whatever you need to do, whatever company you get sent to. So then I told my girlfriend wanted me to move in for us to get a house right when I got back and all this stuff. And I was like, no, I can't do any of that. And it was like an ultimatum. I was like, bye. <laughs> Out. Yeah. So then I was single the rest of my career until I met my wife, you know, at the very, at the end when I was about, you know, on my last deployment about to get out. So getting to first, you know, everybody all these senior guys were legends from like their last deployment, the deployment before that, the deployment before that. So I was thinking this was only stood up for like a year before you got yeah, there. Yeah, but all these guys have been on Force Recon, Iraq. Okay. Like, dude, these are all the saltiest guys that got hand selected to run the Special Operations Battalion from okay. Force Recon. That makes sense. You know sense. what I'm saying? Um, They kind of gutted the unit, but they, I mean, they all, you know, they had some type of selection process. Yeah. These guys were good, you know. They were badass guys that were fucking, they were warriors and fearless, like, in combat kind of, uh, kind of people, vibe. Mm -hmm. And it was like um, a security blanket. When I was in combat, in Afghanistan and I was with those guys, it was a security blanket. (laughs) Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I do. That experience is, there's nothing that can, that can compare to that. Like you can have confidence and abilities, but you have confidence abilities and you have someone on your team that's been through those situations. That's had to use aircraft to survive in the moment and shit like that. That's what you need. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so all those guys were, we, there was only a couple new guys on my team and that new guy experience was invaluable, you know, um, cause you're earning it every day. You know, there's a saying at the unit, every day is a tryout at first Raider battalion. Every day is a tryout, dude. I don't give a shit. It's like, but only like, we only ha- we were like the only like so-and-so to graduate out of our class is like, who cares? Like, you know, not that we were saying that, but like nobody cares about what happened yesterday. Even though you just got turned out at this ITC course and you did shit that was harder than you ever imagined, none of us care one bit because you got to fucking, today's your tryout, you know? Yeah. So like, you know, go to work, earn your spot. What is your, like, you're the new guy on the team. You have no schools. What are you doing here? You know, 
what value do you bring today? Like, all that, you know, like mm-hmm. it was really earn it, which was a really, I love that. You know, that's like a merit, that's what I, the merit based, you know, uh, culture, warrior culture, you know, where you take your rank off, you earn respect, you earn it. And uh, so my officer, my team leader, my first team leader was Derek Carrera, who is one of my mentors, and he ended up getting wounded uh, with me. He's And uh, he ended up getting out a couple years ahead of me. But he lives in Orange County, and I see him regularly. Oh, you guys are still buddies? Still really close, yeah. Um, and he's a, been a huge... Uh, business advisor for me and like helps me with all kinds of strategic stuff Um, and we also started the marine raider challenge well hold on organization that we did we'll talk about later but we'll talk about that later focus yeah but derek brought me in when i was a new guy for counseling and i was like you know sir i don't have any schools like you know and i want to roll i want like a job on the team you know, and he's like, so I'm going to put you as an armorer. I'm like, you own that thing, and then we'll talk about what's next. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I, be- I was an armorer and, like, started tracking all the weapons and, like, making all the rosters and, you know, trying to, like, see what more weapons I could get, what other armory courses I could go to, what kind of certifications, all this different stuff. And then he's like, you know, then I started, fun- like, you know, when – kind of lose gear and then i would find it or like you know stuff like that where i was doing a good job of tracking all the equipment so then they're like all right we're gonna make you track all the equipment when we get to afghanistan you know you're gonna manage the whole like inventory right so then uh i got sent uh early to afghanistan to go sign for gear as a new guy and uh my secondary role was going to be uh, Afghan local police, and I was going to be a, a advisor and trainer. And so when I got there, like, um, before we went to Afghanistan, the team that was there uh, that had just moved into where we were going, it was in 2012 at the beginning, like right as fighting season is kicking off, you know. We know that, and that's a historical thing so it's like we're going into fighting season we're going to be there for the whole thing and um we're it's just kicking off so we're starting to get reports of like when the team's going out on patrol what's happening and stuff like that you know and they were having to come back and they're having they're getting cut off having to bound back to the base and stuff like that you know what i'm saying taking a lot of contact yeah stuff that's like kind of alarming like Like, you're kind of thinking in the back of your head, like, how are we going to live there for seven months if these guys can't even go on patrol, you know? Yeah. And then, like, some of the senior guys that are kind of, like, uh, you know, um, kind of put static out there, they're like, this is fucked. Next on The Sean Ryan Show. Do you want your son to go into this? No. I don't want mine to go into it either. And the NCIS was there with us. What were they doing there? You know, I had all these crazy experiences with my Afghan local commander. And he came up and he was like, hey, can I leave my son here? You know, whatever. And he left one of his sons. So it was like maybe seven years old or something. He gets in his truck and drives around the corner and hits a IED. Like I have to go out and be in lights, all these artificial lights with these loud noises and shit that bothers me and like all the stuff that was driving me insane. Yeah. Got the same shit that I'm watching this, you know, that's like suicidal tendencies. Days after, weeks after, I, I realized how much of a negative impact I was making on my family. For anybody that is, has any of that stuff, the best thing that I could say is just anchor yourself, you know? Call one person. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist 
of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.